Good evening, everyone. I'm guessing you can hear me, right? Okay. So I'm asking for your grace a little bit tonight. This is the first time this commission is meeting in this chamber. There is lots of tech, and we're also not used to the sailing with you being that far away from us. But uh, thank you for your patience. <coughs> so just for the record, this is a Human Relations Commission meeting. Of course, we are in Davis, California. We're starting the meeting a little bit late. It is 6.39, um, January 25th, um, 2024. So I am calling this meeting to order. And Carrie, I think we are ready for the roll call. Thank you. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Gorman? Here. Okay. I'm going to start again with the microphone on. Commissioner Baker? Here. Commissioner Gorman? Here. Chair Mavondo? Here. Vice Chair Mohammed? Here. Commissioner Pickett? Here. Commissioner Wong Chen? Here. Ex officio Leanne Freeman? Here. Ex officio, uh, officio Michael Del Lolo? Here. Ex officio Kate Snow? Here. And I'll note that Ashish uh, Lama, high school ex officio, is going to be here this evening. We do not at this time have any council members. Thank you. Okay, so we are now going to move on to agenda item number two, approval of the agenda. So, fellow commissioners, do we approve the agenda as written? Is there any amendment that's needed at this point? I'm happy to move that we uh, accept the agenda as is. So, we second. Move. Yes. Second by second. Vice Chair Mohammed, thank you. Discussions, questions on that? No. Okay. So, Carrie, if it's okay, we're going to vote by show of hand. Okay. All in, fa in favor of approving the motion, show your hand. Do we have any abstention? Any days? The motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Carrie. Okay. So, agenda item number three, brief announcements from staff, commissioners, and liaison. We're going to start with staff. Carrie, any good news for us? Hopefully good news, please. I don't have any announcements today. I did forward to you all a message that the mayor put out today. <coughs> um, it's been uh, posted on e-notifications mm -hmm. and it's been posted on e-notifications on social media channels. I did say, uh, share it to the Human Relations Commission Facebook page. Thank you, Carrie. I will. Um, thank you, Carrie. So I will turn to our ex officio um, members. So, Kate, do you have any announcements for the public and for us? I think I'd just like to provide an update, I think, to which was a previous announcement, but that uh, in terms of, especially in light of the mayor's statement about um, response to anti Semitism and the hate free campaign, that um, the district continues to evolve. Um, and improve our responses to what can sometimes seem like physical harm to our buildings, such as vandalism, uh, to include uh, identity-based harm that affects members of the um, site where those things are those things are found, but also and to enlarge our thinking um, in our practice, really hone our practice in responsiveness to identity-based harm. So it's happening on a, on a policy base level, a protocol base level, and and. Uh, and we're hoping to get even better and better at that. Thank you. Um, Michael, any, um, anything from UC Davis you would like to share with us? Sure, I'd just like uh, to invite uh, the commission and also the public um, for the upcoming lecture by Cynthia Miller Idris on February 5th, who is the uh, featured book project author. Um, the title of the book is Hate in the Homeland. Uh, the uh, tickets are available at the Mondavi Center. It'll be at 7.30 p.m. Thank you. <coughs> okay, fellow commissioners, anyone has an announcement, something to share, report that is not on the agenda? Not at this time. Um, Carrie, could you remind me, do we take, we don't take public comments on that, right? Public comments starts with the next agenda item. Yes, you'll be moving into okay. Okay, so this concludes our time on agenda item number three. Um, we're now moving on to agenda item number four, so we're opening the floor to public comments. So as a reminder, members of the public, first I would like to welcome you 
uh, to the HRC meeting tonight. Thank you for showing up in a bigger number than we've, used in some, we've seen sometimes. You are invited to address um, the community at this time. Everything you say is on record. You have three minutes <coughs> from the moment you start speaking. As a reminder, we would like you to, um, uh, we invite you to make a comment on an item that is not already on the agenda. So to be clearer, so if you will be addressing <coughs> anything that's related to anti-Semitism in the community, it's coming right after. But anything else not on the agenda, um, please move for, um, forward and, and you know, the floor is yours for three minutes. So while maybe people are thinking, uh, Carrie, do we have any written comments or any recorded ones? We we don't take recorded comments, and we haven't received any written comments for okay. tonight's meeting. Thank you. Okay, one last time. Yes. So you don't have to, but if you would like, you invite to state your name and any affiliation you'd like us to know about, and you have three minutes. Thank sure. I'm uh, Seth Sanders, uh, Jewish Studies, UC Davis. I want to speak about two broad concerns related to community safety. Uh, the first is a long-running one that I've seen before and I think I understand. The second feels new to me, and it's something I don't understand, and is especially concerning to me as a Jew, so it's a little broader, though, than anti-Semitism. The first is, ever since I got to Davis eight years ago to teach in Jewish studies and religious studies, there's a small group of out-of-town white nationalists, also vo vocal Trump supporters, who do things like disrupt liberal and leftist events, harass peace activists, etc. They also venture into Davis one or two times a year under the cover of night, uh, and we know this week one guy, uh, Jeffrey Perrin of Orangeville, California, put up some uh, sort of disgusting Nazi flyers with anti-Jewish mythology on them, uh, on some cars downtown. Fortunately, a group of anti-racist activists uh, tracked them, got pictures of the guy, which is how we know this. Now, this individual has never harassed me for being a Jew. I know he'd like to. Uh, he hasn't had the chance. What's more confusing to me and disturbing is my first experience of being targeted specifically uh, for my religious activities as a Jew in Davis for conducting a Jewish ceremony a month ago uh, out here. Uh, There's a group of Jewish and left activists, uh, much like the group typically targeted by white nationalists, was doing a Hanukkah candle lighting in front of City Hall. We even had my, my little son, who was very proud of just having learned to play the shofar. Now, this is technically not part of Hanukkah, I have to tell you, but he, was, he wanted to, to show off a little bit. Uh, to my surprise, I found our prayers disrupted by people chanting, waving banners, it's kind of, you know, MAGA-like stuff, and I was told they were a group of nationalists, Jewish nationalists in this case. I, I have never experienced, this is the first time in my life, I experienced someone trying to drown out Jewish prayers in a public ceremony. Uh, that night, there were also three experiences of hate speech. Uh, I think these were not anti-Semitic, they were uh, racist, including anti-Palestinian slurs, uh, denying that Palestinians are actually native to their homeland, saying one of the young women speaking in tears that their family must be terrorists, which I assume means they deserve to die in, uh, in, in combat. Uh, I met a mother whose children go to my son's school who was in tears telling me how afraid she was because of these threats, this atmosphere of intimidation. What concerns me is this pattern of harassing pro-peace Jews and Palestinians may be systemic and part of a bigger picture uh, and a longer history at Davis. And um, a woman named Julia Reifkind, who had been president of Aggies for Israel in 2015, then moved on to be director of community affairs at the Israeli embassy in Washington, uh, described in interviews conducting surveillance of fellow UC Davis students and passing the information on to the Israeli embassy, cooperating with a group of UC Davis professors. Now, I mean, I don't know if she was exaggerating. These were just her words. Uh, but if there is any basis at all for this, uh, it is disturbing. And what describes, what happened, what she describes does fit with the experiences of some students. UC Davis graduate students describe experience of censorship and surveillance carried out by students and faculty, Palestinian and Arab grad students being taunted, stalked, or uh, harassed with slurs like terrorist, terrorist sympathizer, ISIS, baby killer, etc. Uh, by students and faculty who are also photographing and demanding their names, uh, presumably in order to retaliate against students engaging in what is protected educational and political endeavors. Uh, and, and, and this also was shared with me by some, some students uh, at Davis. So I think there is something to this. And what I want to know is how we can work together to make my fellow Jews, uh, community members, and Davis students feel safe to express their identity and beliefs free from harassment. Thank you. Seth Saunders, 
Thank you for coming tonight and addressing, yes. addressing us. And it's also nice to meet you in person, if I may say. Um, as a reminder, <clears throat> since there are several of you tonight, um, know that you can decide to yield your time um, to someone so the person has an opportunity to speak for more than three minutes. So I encourage you to take advantage of that if it's something you want to do. Mm -hmm. And we've made notes of your recommendations at the end of your comments. Thank you. Yes. I'm Leah Starker, I'm a student. Yes, very um, nice to meet you. I just microphone. wanted to... Microphone is not really short, sorry. <laughs> I just wanted to let you guys know that, like, as a student on campus, I am involved in two Jewish organizations. I'm a practicing Jew, and I've been harassed for having certain beliefs, and the fact that I don't feel safe expressing my political beliefs on this campus is scary, and that I've been monitored at protests on numerous accounts. I've had people show cameras in my face. I've known the people videotaping me as part of a major Jewish organization on campus. One where I've had one of their staff members that's paid come and harass me at my own event verbally and yell at me for having factual information on a board and teaching people. And then they've sent, some organizations have sent a lot of their students to my events, all of them, to come and disrupt, so they'll spend 20 minutes telling us to go through every slide so they can take pictures, they'll try and ask for the slides, they'll try and record us, which I'm told is pretty illegal. <coughs> and I've also been told by the staff members at this Jewish organization that I'm a Hamas supporter because my organization didn't post anything on October 7th, and then they told me that I'm personally a threat to their safe space, and that my organization cannot be affiliated with them, even though we are all Jewish organizations. And yeah, just wanted to say that. Thank you uh, for your comment. It's not even on the record. Are there additional public comments on items not yet on the agenda? So as a reminder, this is public comments. The next agenda item is going to be about hate incidents happening in Davis, head assault, and uh, you'll have the opportunity to speak on that. So if there is no more public comments, <coughs> Yes. I, um, I'm not sure if this is the right <laughs> moment or venue even. I'm, not, um, I'm, I'm a newbie to the uh, Human Relations Com Committee meeting, but I just wanted to put a word forward. Um, I'm a parent of a, a developmentally disabled adult, and just putting a word forward to keep that group of people, both the developmentally disabled individuals and their families, um, particularly their aging parents, um, in mind as, as part of this committee. I was driving here and thinking, it's sort of funny, I almost <laughs> don't want to come because I don't like driving at night anymore. <laughs> um, so for this particular group, it's, it's a little harder to even make it here um, at this kind of meeting. Uh, is there a subcommittee on, or any kind of con focus on developmentally disabled? So okay. intellectually disabled? I'm going to invite you, if there is more that you want to say, I will invite you to continue talking because the moment I start speaking, you won't re we won't be able to have a back and forth, just so you know. But is okay. there anything else you wanted to add before I answer? I guess just that I feel like this is an underrepresented group in mm -hmm. terms of just what is brought forward for mm -hmm. obvious reasons mm -hmm. and um, would like that to be just on the radar. Absolutely. Thank you. So. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to use my privilege as chair here, where sometimes I can um, act a little bit outside of the rules. So normally we're not, you know, answering comments. We're taking them on records, and then um, as a commission, we're able to uh, to talk and hopefully make recommendations to city council. <clears throat> but um, to the person who left the public comment, uh, she's leaving. Are you coming back or? Okay, so I'll wait for you to come back and then I, I can. Oh. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, okay, I'm going to be very quick. I just wanted to let you know that we heard what you said, especially when it comes to um, our community members dealing with you know, disability, including the parents, caring parents, aging parents. Um, <clears throat> I invite you, if you have um, the ability in terms of energy, to also send us an email, um, a written email. And the reason I'm sharing that is because one of the things that the Commission has set out to focus on in this coming year is disability justice and how um, uh, basically it's being practiced in the city of Davis in our community. So we have a series of workshops that we are hoping pending the city council giving its green light. 
to roll out with one theme being explored um, every month. So where we bring community members together, we don't just have um, a conversation, but we are hoping also that there is practical resources and advice given to community members so they can, you know, show more solidarity or, you know, just be more open and so there is, you know, um, we make our community more inclusive. And uh, again, the topic of, you know, members with a disability um, is part of that program. So um, again, I invite you to please keep in touch with us, um, continue to provide feedback and keep us accountable. We're here to represent all of you and, and thank you so much for what you shared tonight. Thank you. Any additional public comments before we close that agenda item? Okay, I don't see any at this time. This concludes our time on agenda item number four. We're moving on to agenda item number five, um, the consent calendar. So more specifically, uh, let's look at um, 5A, so the minutes of November 16, uh, refer to attachment A, right? And then I'm, I'm just going to stop there first and ask uh, my fellow commissioners if you approve the minutes as you have received them. I have a clarification. It's yes. On page two, a clarification and a, and a correction. Uh, top of page two, um, first bullet point uh, should be anti-Semitic. Just the spelling. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And a clarification under uh, di item D, committee updates, where the commission workshop subcommittee, um, the, where it says staff will prepare proposal, go to council on December 5th or 7th. That should be that it's a report findings to the HRC as a whole. Excuse me, that should be down to the third bullet point, Community Listening Subcommittee. Oh, okay. My apologies. Do you see it, Carrie? Yes. Okay. Just to add a report finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> so the first bullet point, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, are we ready to approve the minutes with the amendments that were um, just shared? So we're referring to November 16, 2023. I make a motion to approve the November 16th minutes as corrected. Thank you, Vice Chair Mohammed. Do we have a second? I'll second. Commissioner Piquet. Um, discussions on that? No? Okay, all in favor, show your hand. I don't see any abstentions. Okay, no one against, so the motion passes unanimously. Uh, let's move on to 5B. Please uh, look at the attachment B, uh, minutes of December 13th, 2023. Any, um, anything that needs a correction when it comes to this? Okay, apparently no. Are we ready to make a motion to approve? So moved. Commissioner Baker, do we have a second? Second. Vice Chair Mohammed, any discussions? Feedback on that? No? Okay, so all in favor? of approving the minutes of December 13 as is show hand. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. This concludes our time on agenda item five. So now we are going to discuss our regular agenda items and we're starting with the public forum on rape hate incidents um, in the Davis community. I want to be mindful of there are some people with us tonight who I understand have to leave early and we know we have, you know, um, responsibilities also um, outside of this chamber. So um, <clears throat> I will try to listen to the public comments as early as we can. Um, we might be quite a few, have quite a few tonight. Before we listen to public comments, um, I want to ask commissioners if there's something in particular that they want to um, make sure is uh, under our radar. And we're going to, to listen to the public. So I will get us started. Um, they were, there was report, I received reports of more anti semitic incidents in the community. They were um, threatening flyers um, left on um, some people's cars. 
Um, there's been like websites specifically targeting Davis with uh, the name of the city of Davis is in the URL. Um, also with various samples um, that are pretty hateful. And then um, my understanding also <coughs> is that the last city council meeting um, was tense. Um, I, I wasn't there, but I, uh, the video is online and so on. So um, I think we have quite a lot to discuss tonight. Before we listen to the public, is there anything that any commissioner would like to share? Before we open the floor, yes, Connor. Yeah, so I just wanted to mention something that a friend of mine asked me to bring up. Uh, one of their co-workers uh, was experiencing anti-Asian hate uh, in the past, I believe, month or so, uh, where they were by a laundry mat, uh, and they were essentially told by someone to, um, like, that they should go back to their own country and those types of things. So uh, that is something that my friend asked me to... Uh, to bring up under this item. Thank you, Colin. I think we will have to come back to it at some point um, so that we explore um, what we can do moving forward. Anyone else? Yes, you. Um, so in response to what has been a series of anti-Semitic uh, comments and statements and um, I want to say something worse than that, that have happened in the schools um, this year, We've had uh, conversations with the Yolo Confluent Resolution Center, and they've just come in yesterday for the first time to meet with a group of students at Da Vinci High to train them in some conflict resolution conversations so that um, students can feel more confident standing up when they hear things that are, like they're giving them tools and language for redirecting conversation and for, um, and for having difficult conversations in the face of things that are um, offensive. And so I guess I just want to remind us all that Yolo Conflict Resolution Center, they did an awesome job with teenagers at our school, and I think we're going to really try, we already, the schools already have a relationship with them and, and sort of an open kind of contract with them. Um, so it's really pretty seamless to get them into the schools to work with students on, um, teachers can catch things, administration can catch things, but students are, right there when things happen. And so I I want to just encourage us to be more kids involved in the schools as well, of course, and how we can use that resource to continue to strengthen our students' ability to stand up for injustices, against injustice when they see it. Um, I'll add that um, the Community Listening Subcommittee, in which uh, Kevin and I and Lainey are um, members, uh, we'll have to give them a more fuller, a fuller report under committee updates portion, uh, but we have been receiving information from um, uh, Graduate Student Association um, in terms of conversations that are taking place and specifically a resolution um, that was passed. Um, just lots of information coming from different perspectives um, that we are making a record of to be part of this more general conversation here as well, but I'll reserve additional comments so we can get to public comment sooner. Yes, Commissioner Baker. I figured out how to do the light. <coughs> Excuse me, the light. I just also want to note, speaking of the uh, Yolo Conflict Resolution Center, that um, <coughs> the city also has noted that there is an upcoming event called Addressing Hate Conversation on Understanding, Reflection, and Responsibility. This is Tuesday, February 13th from 4.30 to 6, I'm sorry, 4 to 6 p.m. at the Manetti Schwinn Museum presented by the Yolo Conflict Resolution Center. And that is an event that I'm told is open to um, community members um, in the city and uh, UC Davis. Thank you. Remind us the date on that. Tuesday, February 13th, 4 to 6 p.m., Manetti Schramm Museum on the campus. Thank you. Thank you. It looks like registration is encouraged or may be required, so there's a link to fill out a registration. And they will be allowing also people to speak up on the topic, from my understanding. Okay, so um, before we open the public comment, is there one more person who would like to share anything? So um, we're about to you know, listen to um, our community members. Before you move forward, I just want to give you a quick, <coughs> quick, 
quick information because um, it's likely that you were not able to attend our December meeting and we had a technical difficulty because normally our meetings are recorded and the recording is made available online except that there was again a problem and the meeting was recorded um, but unfortunately uh, we couldn't post it. So I just want to let you know that in December we had several community members come forth. We received several public comments as well um, and uh, those were from members of our Jewish community and they, they had some requests for the Commission to consider and I want to read them out loud um, because the Commission discussed it and eventually we moved um, uh, forward in integrating that in the series of workshops that we're working on. <clears throat> so this is what was asked by several people, they basically everyone was asking the same thing, that we consider conducting a Davis-wide climate survey that includes uh, Jewish as an identity marker to understand different community experiences of inclusion, belonging, and hate in Davis. And I also need to mention that um, <clears throat> the, when this was being asked, people uh, actually opened that up not just for the Jewish community, but it was inclusive of um, other you know, identities that um, might be also under duress right now. So the Muslim community was mentioned because there is also a rise in Islamophobia and uh, the you know, LGBTQ plus as well. Um, also holding focus groups, uh, focus groups sorry, with different groups, holding a workshop series on different groups represented in the community, providing education on who we are, our history and culture and creating spaces for interfaith and intercommunity dialogues. And you know, um, this is a request for the city and our council member party that is here, just mentioning it for the record, allocating city funds to provide safety and security for um, faith congregations such as Congregation Ben Havering um, for protection um, for the congregants and security during the services. So just um, <coughs> again, mentioning that <coughs> we have received the comments that the majority of the comments, as I mentioned, were inclusive of you know many of the different groups um, in Davis who are also under duress at the moment. At this point, we're opening the floor to public comments, and um, so please, you're invited to um, address the community. You're invited to share your name. You don't have to, and then you have three minutes. And you can have more time if you have members of the public giving their time to you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you, NJ, and I'm very happy to hear that you guys are working on some workshops. Um, there's a lot of healing to be done in our community. Um, my name is Mayan. I've lived in Davis for most of my life. Only since October 7th have I wondered whether it's safe to keep Nationwide anti-Semitic attacks have risen by over 300% during the time between October 7th and December 7th, as compares to the same time period last year. The amount of hate I have seen in this town and online is unprecedented, but it is the lack of response that concerns me the most. Like many of us who grew up in Davis, I moved back here to raise a family because I share the Davis values that we in this room hold dear celebrating diversity, standing up against discrimination and hate. I hear concern when groups like the Proud Boys and other white supremacists <coughs> hang banners from the highway overpass. And just this weekend, with the anti-Semitic flyers that you mentioned, but we don't often see the same kind of recognition or response when Jews are targeted with anti-Semitism from the other side of the political spectrum. So often, this iteration of old anti-Semitic tropes uses dog whistles and other subtler means to demonize and scapegoat Jews. We ask that the members of this commission and the members of the city council look at some of the resources provided online and some of the trainings on the ADL website so that you can learn to identify all forms of anti-Semitism. This is the first step that we ask you to take in order to address this frightening trend. When we were still reeling from the nightmarish images Hamas posted from their attack on October 7th, we learned just a couple days later that assistant professor at UC Davis, Shema de Cristo, had tweeted 
One group of people we have easy access to in the U.S. are all these Zionist journalists who spread propaganda and misinformation. They have houses and addresses, kids in school. They can fear their bosses, but they should fear us more. Though I have no affiliation with UCD, this type of rhetoric from someone who teaches young and impressionable students directly endangers me. And she isn't unique. This past weekend, a graduate student responsible for teaching on campus, quote unquote, has shared many anti-Semitic messages calling for violence and supporting global antifada, posted on Twitter a message that sounded like he was ready to carry out an attack. You may be inclined to shrug it off as online rhetoric and a problem for UCD. No. When I saw these tweets last weekend, I wondered if he decided to make good on DeCristo's call to find Zionists and their children. Would my eight-month-old and I be the first on his list? After all, I was the first to speak at, at last week's city council open comment. All it takes is one person to act on these calls to violence. And we are seeing so many young people radicalized by misinformation online. As we saw in the 2018 Tree of Life synagogue shooting, or the 2019 New Jersey grocery store shooting, or the Poe, California shooting, also in 2019, Jews all over the US are wondering if it's safe to attend synagogue. We wonder if we are next. We see a growing group of individuals supporting violence, and yet leaders hesitate to denounce these incidents because they don't want to quote unquote take sides in the Israel Hamas war or be seen as supporting Israel. But denouncing calls to violence is not taking a side. Hate is never the way forward. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. I have a resource from the ADL website on Pyramid of Hate. It has biased attitudes, acts of bias, systematic discrimination, and we are now at seeing bias motivated violence, <coughs> threats, and vandalism in our community. Thank you, Maya. Carrie, is it possible to add to the minutes later on? Okay. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Hi, good evening. Um, my name is Naomi, and I have also lived in Davis for the majority of my life. Last week, I attended the DJUSD school board meeting and heard from students, including as young as a sixth grader, who had experienced anti-Semitic attacks from their peers and even from a faculty member. Until leaders, including those in local government, take an unequivocal stand against anti-Semitism, the climate that has enabled children on our playgrounds to make threats about finishing what Hitler started will continue to grow. Many people in the audience at the meeting seem sincerely surprised to hear about what's been happening. So I think a spotlight needs to be shown on this problem. And with this in mind, um, it sounds like you already are, but I'm just renewing our ask to conduct a community survey to gather data on perceptions of safety and inclusion, as well as establish a method for documenting anti-Semitic attack incidents as both a basis for response and monitoring. And we suggest that the city council do this in tandem with DJUSD and UCD to provide a holistic approach in our geographic community. Um, the last commenter spoke about anti-Semitism on both sides of the political spectrum, <clears throat> and anti-Semitism on the left often takes the form of demonizing, delegitimizing, or applying a double standard to the Jewish state, as opposed to making global generalizations about Jews. Anti-Semitism on the left most often presents as anti-Zionism, which has its roots in Soviet-era anti-Semitic propaganda. Anti-Zionism is denying the Jewish right to self-determination in its ancestral homeland. It is not the same as criticizing Israeli policies, which is not anti-Semitic. Over 80% of the world's Jews are Zionists, but we don't necessarily agree with each other on much beyond that. Um, I have some handouts on anti-Zionism, which I will pass out later. Um, but the reason I bring this up is because a couple of weeks ago, one of our Jewish community members had red hands graffitied on their property. Red handprints have been used in anti-Israel protests and demonstrations recently, such as the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade this year in New York. And I have material on that as well. Um, at that parade, a Jewish uh, library building that had been donated by a Jew, quote unquote, a Zionist billionaire, was um, vandalized with red handprints. And it's worth mentioning that the origin of the use of <coughs> bloody or red handprints in the context of the Israel-Palestinian conflict dates back to 2000. Um, when 
uh, two Israeli Defense Force reservists were brutalized and killed, and um, the red handprints are from started at that event. I don't have time to go into the details on that, but I'll pass that around as well. And I, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want to ask you not to minimize or turn your head away from these acts on the basis of where they come from. Um, we were asked not to provide any specifics about this incident because the victim is afraid of escalating retaliation. The Jewish community member is, that particular Jewish community member is actually one of dozens who have expressed their unwillingness to freely express themselves on the public record or identify themselves publicly for fear of violence and retaliation. Um, we know as Jews that when we're scapego scapegoated for the societal ill de jour, in the past it's been communism, capitalism, right now it's imperialism and colonialism. Um, violence against our community escalates really quickly and things become normalized when leaders stay silent or fail to act. So we ask that you do the opposite. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Hi, my name is Dan Ovadia. I've lived and worked in Davis for over 33 years. Um, death to America, death to Israel, curse the Jews, and victory for Islam. These are some of the examples of things we are experiencing in Davis since October 7th. Israel harvests the organs of Palestinian children. Israelis drink the blood of Palestinian children. Jews control the media. October 7th massacre of women and the raping of women is justified and morally legal. These are things we see in our community, on campus, from people, um, in this community, including at the farmer's market where the Party for Socialism and Liberation had a booth which showed anti-Semitic tropes for weeks after the attack, including claiming that Israel was established by a collaboration between the Nazis and Zionists. That is anti-Semitism. It was in the farmer's market for weeks. The Party for Socialism and Liberation National Answer Coalition and several other Marxist groups are orchestrating a campaign of anti-Semitism right in our community. They are recruiting people, they are indoctrinating people, and they are spreading extremism and misinformation in this town on a weekly basis. They are vandalizing campus, they are spreading flyers throughout town. They are highly organized, they are highly coordinated. <coughs> Students for Justice in Palestine is deeply connected with the Party for Socialism and Liberation who celebrated the attacks. Let me say that again. They celebrated the mass rape of innocent women on their website. And then they denied it two, uh, two months later. PSL denied the attack even happened, which is another form of denial. This is what we're talking about, not legitimate criticism, we're not having a conversation in this town. We are being subjected to an orchestrated effort by extremist groups in this town. Yes, there are neo-Nazis here. The majority of what we've seen on campus, and yes, we are documenting this extremely carefully, it's very, very important to document, just like Southern Poverty Law Center documents incidents, we are documenting incidents to see how serious this is. We take this very, very seriously. My children went through high school here. They were exposed to some of this. It has never been this bad, ever. And so I just appreciate your time, appreciate your action, appreciate you listening. Thank you. Dan, thank you for your comment tonight. Um, I know we have, we're going to listen to more people. <coughs> We'd like to encourage you if you're recording an incident. Um, thank you for mentioning that you are documenting it. Um, please also let us know if you have spoken to the authorities type of home plan and so on, so that we are able to access the public record. Next public speaker, please. Thank you again, Dan. Hello, uh, my name is Yanir. My family and I live here in Davis, and our four children are students in the district here. Um, we have witnessed the emerging anti-Semitic and anti-Zionist incidents in Davis since October 7th and at growing rate since December 12th. 
as an ongoing effort to, uh, that was discussed by us in Davis City Council, in the district board meeting, and during the meeting with UC Davis leaders, we would like to ask you the following. Uh, first is taking the ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, training on anti-bias uh, or attending a countering anti-Semitism workshop. Uh, another ask is to uh, establish an ongoing city force team that will work on monitoring the situation and updating city plans accordingly, and that might be the subcommittee that you already mentioned before. Uh, another ask is to uh, is for data collection, which can be done uh, through uh, conducting a community survey, just as you mentioned, and, and uh, I would appreciate it if you could um, tell us how it's going on and how can we help uh, doing that, uh, and also establishing a method for documenting anti-Semitic uh, incidents as a basis for both immediate response and monitoring. Uh, another ask is for raising awareness of the rise of anti-Semitism along the political spectrum, and that includes uh, suggesting the City Council to adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism to a resolution, a formal resolution. Uh, another issue can be encouraging city council members to make clear statements uh, denouncing recent anti-Semitism incidents in Davis and affirming their commitment to the values of safety and inclusion and deal with the growing phenomenon. And we just got the message from the mayor today. Uh, so I think this might be the first step in the right direction. Uh, another issue is uh, to initiate public events such as Jewish Heritage Day as a form to learn about, celebrate Judaism and help Jews feel welcome. Uh, we would also ask uh, to, add, uh, to combat anti-Semitism in Davis to add that issue to your two-on-two -two agendas with the district and with UC Davis. And finally, um, to address the lack of safety felt by Jewish residents in the city and presenting the city's plan of response to individualized attacks such as mentioned, and you already mentioned it was discussed in the previous uh, meeting, so we should uh, follow up and see what, in, what is uh, done so far. So thank you. Thank you, Yanni, for your, your comments. I, I don't think I'm going to go over three minutes, but my daughter, who's here, is yielding her time. She's not fully okay. mobile, so I'm just doing that for I'm her. noticing the teamwork. Okay. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Dima Tamimi. Uh, the recent incidents of hateful anti-Semitic flyers distributed by a white supremacist concerns me greatly. I've also heard of incidents of the N-word being written on DJUSD campus walls and anti-Semitic symbols as well. And it was not too long ago when many of our city leaders marched in solidarity to stand up against Islamophobia and the vandalizing of our mosque. I hope that as a community we work together to ensure that that kind and all kinds of hate is addressed. And perhaps it's the thing that the majority of this community can rally against we certainly should not take our eye off the white supremacy ball. But I want to address some of what Seth brought up earlier. I do wish to express my concern with equating the call for a ceasefire or expressing care for Palestinians with anti-Semitism. Asking for an end to violent attacks that have today killed over 25,000 civilians in Gaza is not an anti-Semitic sentiment. It is a human sentiment. It is a peaceful sentiment. So I just ask that we are thoughtful in what we deem to be anti-Semitic. This is crucial because if we begin to expand the meaning to include everything under the sun that has to do with critiquing the Israeli or US government or anything that might seem pro-Palestinian, the cry of anti-Semitism will lose its impact 
and its credibility. Empathy towards those who claim it for truly threatening reasons will be at risk of being ignored because the definition will become too broad for us to take seriously at all. It is my belief that we need to be very careful about equating criticism of a government with hate speech. I have said this several times on this podium, and I'll say it again today, but the criticism of a government is not a condemnation of a people or a faith. So let's be sure not to equate protests and statements against the acts and policies of the Israeli government and its current leadership as anti-Semitic. As you deliberate on ways to ensure everyone in the community can feel safe, I think it's important to look at the data on hate incidents, and we should take any rise in these incidents in totality and towards individual groups very seriously. I'd like to note, though, that reporting of incidents of marginalized groups before such reporting becomes normalized often results in reduced reporting of incidents by those groups. For example, reporting of sexual assault has become much more normalized in recent years, and so reporting has gone up as more people feel comfortable bringing up their stories and their grievances. Complaints by Arab, Muslim, and Palestinians has not been normalized due to the long history of de the dehumanization of these people. So while many have complaints, please consider that they may not feel comfortable complaining. I can say that for myself, I have experienced Palestinian discrimination and have also felt threatened and dehumanized. So much though, that so for a long portion of my life, I've chosen to avoid sharing my heritage altogether or to center the other half of my heritage, which is Egyptian. While I have seen and experienced negative and threatening Palestinian sentiment my entire life, I have never made a public or formal comp complaint because I have never felt safe in being able to do that. I still do not. I don't feel safe now, and I know others that are not here now and have not spoken up are not doing so out of a very deep and real fear. Given this, I ask that you consider that and you consider population size, student and occupation status, and other important statistics and variables as you do an analysis of this data. Lastly, I wanted to note that I've heard that there is a desire to perhaps hold more forums for public storytelling and witnessing to help members heal. <clears throat> While on the surface, I really like this idea, I ask you that you consider this very carefully and ensure that people truly feel safe. Diverse voices are ensured to be there and that conflict resolution experts are present and I was gonna bring up the Yolo Conflict Resolution Center. I do think public witnessing is an important part of healing to many, but if it devolves into a debate or if a whole group of the community doesn't feel safe enough to be there, such a gathering may do more harm than good. People have already expressed to me privately that they don't feel safe sharing their stories in public spaces right now. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dima, for your comments and your suggestions. Good evening, Anish. Good evening. Um, thank you for being here this evening. Um, I wanted to, I'm not speaking particularly on behalf of Davis Peaks Coalition this evening, but I am, as a member of Davis Peaks Coalition, party to a lot of conversations from people across the spectrum of this conflict in Gaza. Um, and so I want to help widen the lens a bit uh, as we talk about this. So in terms of what is happening at schools, um, Certainly, there are many students of marginalized communities who have consistently experienced all kinds of uh, slurs and aggression. Um, so when, we, when I'm hearing the kinds of uh, anti-Semitic uh, incidents happening in schools, it is also putting me in mind of you know, black kids who are called the N-word. Um, LGBTQ students that are called anti-gay slurs. Uh, there are jokes that from student to student about slavery to black kids. There has been, you know, unfortunately these things go through trends and from 2016 to 2020 there were a lot of jokes towards Latina kids about deportation. And while Jewish kids may be able to hide their stars of David, there are certain members of our community that are unable to hide their identity in order to be safe. 
And so this is, as we talk about these kinds of incidents in schools, I would like us to really consider creating solidarity across all of these marginalized communities because they are all experiencing, having similar experiences, even as each aggression is its own particular form of bigotry. I want to echo something that Dina said, which is that I have definitely heard from members of our Muslim community who do not feel safe coming to speak. Um, that, you know, while um, people are talking about the kinds of aggressions <coughs> that they are experiencing, there is an entire section of our population that doesn't even feel safe coming out to express it and to ask for support. Um, and additionally, I am getting things like um, spray painting of Free Palestine as evidence of anti-Semitism. And you know, one of the reasons that we have focused on white supremacy is that the flyers, for example, that were in Davis on Sunday, those are very clearly anti-Semitic. And that is agreed upon by everyone in the Jewish community. Whereas the position on what can be done about Palestinians in Israel, that is not something where there is consensus. The Jewish community is not a monolith. And so the right wing has presented a very clear and present danger, as one of the speakers mentioned when we were talking about shootings in synagogues and things like that. That does not mean that we should ignore uh, anti-Semitism on other parts of the spectrum, but also there is a lot of ignorance. For example, a lot of people do not understand the full implications of the word Zionist. And so they are deploying it out of ignorance and not out of specific anti-Semitism. And that is a place where we need education. So um, I just want us, from our part, we are trying to consider the good of the community as a whole. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening. Good evening, uh, good evening commissioners. Um, I haven't had the pleasure of speaking to the commission before. I appreciate your volunteering for these spots and listening to this rather difficult conversation. Um, as a longtime resident of Davis, going back 1965, and growing up here as a kid, and then coming back and raising them. Um, my, uh, by the way, did I say I was Scott Stewart? Yes, I'm Scott Stewart. Um, the um, what strikes me about this conversation tonight, and I think it is a conversation, uh, is that there is a need for this commission to arrive at a balance uh, of the community, or an inclusivity of the community in whatever results from your deliberations about how to address real fears and concerns. I have been uh, trying to reconcile between my Jewish friends and me being Jewish uh, historically as well as having uh, Palestinian friends and Arab friends about how this conversation can take place. And I'll tell you that there is not a lot of room between the extremes. And that's the difficult part. But there is room for people who are less driven by, uh, I would say, uh, ideologies that really strident um, and create images and motivations to intimidate other people from speaking. I'm here also because I believe there are people that I know that would not be here to speak to you about how Palestinians have been treated over 70 years, and that they do not uh, at all endorse anything that Hamas has done, including October 7th, but that they also feel that there is no, they have no agency, they're condemned before they arrive. So I think that this is something to consider uh, in our culture. Davis is not a monolith of, you know, that can withstand the pressures unscathed from outside that the flyers are a testament to that. So what do we do together is what I'm asking in, in an inclusive, balanced way 
that creates real safety. Um, that's a positive step, maybe more than one thing. And I thank you for my time. Thank you, Scott. Good evening. Good evening, Commissioner. My name is Michael Levy. I'm a 23-year resident of Davis since uh, after college. Went to UC Davis here, too. I'm currently on the board of directors of Hillel at Davis in Sacramento. I have a child who, uh, until recently, has been in the Davis Joint Unified School District. The argument that the hate is coming from the right is unfortunate because those of us who are Jewish in Davis know that not to be true. I will read you an example of something that my child receives frequently from her high school colleagues at Davis High School. This one comes from a cultural studies student at UC Davis, a PhD student. Quote, the violence I feel towards the entire colonial apparatus here and abroad has never been this heightened. I don't know how to live with all of this anger. It's destroying me. I just want a normal life. I hate that I wish death upon so many people and things. I will not resolve this anger without the resolution of colonia coloniality. The two are inextricably linked. Death to America, death to Israel. I will create a better life for myself and for others or die trying. When the Jewish community reports this to the city council, and I'm not criticizing every council member, the comment that came back from the city clerk was, that's UC Davis, not our department. When Jews complain to certain council members, not every council member, about anti-Semitism on campus, the response was, we have no influence over UC Davis. Of course, the city council has two-by-two two meetings with UC Davis. The city council has two-by-two two meetings with the Joint Unified School District. My own daughter has had to defriend many, many, many co-classmates who celebrate October 7th and call for her death and death of all Jews. When people say that a ceasefire doesn't have an effect on us, they ignore our own family members who are hostages or who are in the IDF or who suffered the horrific violence and rape and mutilation on October 7th that the world has forgotten about, that the United Nations didn't report for two months. And I will spare you the graphic details of the grotesque things that were done to Israeli women, not just Jewish women, but Israeli women on October 7th. If you read the New York Times article, which you should read, you'll see some of it. To call for a ceasefire without calling for Hamas to lay down its arms and release the hostages is telling Israelis of all ethnicities, nationalities, and religions that they should allow, in Sinwar's words, the butcher of Palestine, as they call him, that October 7th was just a rehearsal, let it happen again. 1,200 Israelis slaughtered in some of the most barbaric ways possible affects us here. It would be as though 40,000 Americans had died on 9-11. I would like to implore you to remember when you, we say that we don't feel safe in Davis, California, and that you think that this is new, or some people think that this is new, remember please the words of Imam Shaheen, Islamic Center of Davis in 2017. Pray, O oh Allah, liberate the Al-Aqsa Mosque from the filth of the Jews and annihilate them down to the very last one. Do not spare any of them. O oh Allah, make this happen by our hands. Let us play a part in this. That's Davis, California. And when the shouts of from the river to the sea, which is code for slaughter seven million Jewish Israelis and two million non-Jewish Israeli Arabs of all faiths. And when you hear the words resistance, know that the words are violence is okay against colonialism. When we came out to the city council chambers in the middle of Hanukkah on a week and a half notice for the city council to pass a ceasefire ordinance and we were told by the city clerk, you might have to cancel your plans and your religious worship if you would like to testify and give some facts contrary to what we're about to do. That was reprehensible. 
We're grieving, we're mourning. I will give you one more statistic and then I will yield the microphone. According to FBI statistics, Jews are three times more likely than black people to be the victims of hate crimes and nearly six times more likely to be the victims of hate crimes and anti-Muslim hate. We are by far and away the most targeted group and there is rarely, if ever, ever, and certainly not in this community, a singular condemnation of anti-Semitism without the whataboutisms of other communities, which completely ignores our experience and our unique issues of being Jewish and being subject to hate from the left and from the right. Thank you for your time tonight, and thank you for considering this. Thank you, Micah. Do we have any <coughs> additional public comments? Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Commission, for, um, for being here this evening and opening up the public comment. My name is Erica. Um, I've been a Davis resident for the past 20 years. Um, <coughs> my Jewish father is a longtime peace activist, and he encouraged a model, a way of being in the world, a commitment to repair work. It's one of the highest Jewish values. Rather than simply giving money to charities, which does nothing to change power dynamics, we dedicate ourselves toward the deep work that is needed to dismantle systematic inequalities in our world, and we take it seriously. It was this Jewish value uh, of repair work that led me to participate in the 2019 delegation to the occupied territories in the West Bank of Palestine. There, I saw with my own eyes the real impact of a decades-long military occupation on Palestine where our U.S. tax dollars support the systematic domination, dispossession, and dehumanization of an entire people. The most powerful aspect of this delegation, it was an interfaith delegation, was the Palestinian people themselves. While they're quite aware that our American tax dollars fund the very, very military occupation that is keeping a boot on their necks, Palestinian people opened their heart hearts, their homes, their community spaces, and they became our teachers. We also learned, and were inspired to learn, that a large number of the Palestinian people that we met and talked to have spent many years studying the civil rights movement of the United States, Dr. King, as well as the um, end of the anti-apartheid anti -apartheid movement that began uh, in response to South African apartheid. It was one of the most humbling experiences of my life while my Jewish father taught me the importance of doing repair work in the world, it was the Palestinian people that gave me the strength and the knowledge to put my heart into their freedom struggle. Anti-Semitism must be called out, and people must be held accountable when such vile, vile acts of hate are perpetrated. But the threat is from rising white nationalism and fascism, fascism in this country that's now interwoven into parts of our own political landscape and emboldened by certain powerful political actors not by protesters or activists speaking out against genocide and supremacy that's perpetrated by the state of Israel. Israel uses Judaism as a weapon, and it exploits Jews in this country in furtherance of those goals. I'll never stop exposing that. We are told that a strong Jewish state is needed to make Jews safer in the world, but what Israel is doing is actually making Jews less safe. As long as it is subjugating an entire people as it is doing, engaging in genocide and the ongoing dispossession of land, systematic deprivation of basic rights, cutting off access to food, water, electricity on an entire population, I will never stay silent. That doesn't make me anti-Semitic. Israel claims it represents all Jews, but it doesn't represent me. It doesn't represent my father. It doesn't represent my sister. It doesn't represent any of the Jews that I choose to be in community with. And I have a lot more to say, and I think some of it was also expressed in a letter that I sent to your council about my great, great concern on First Amendment free speech rights and my ability, as long as this genocide is going on, to call out the state that is engaging in genocidal acts. Thank you. Thank you, Erika, for your comment. Um, hello, I am a student at UC Davis, <coughs> and as a Jewish and an Israeli student, I very much care about anti-Semitism. It's obviously a very important issue to me, and I in no way deny that it is in fact a big issue um, in the United States and including in Davis. 
Um, however, I would like to say that it's very important to me that claims of anti-Semitism, whether um, including the fact that they are often um, that they are often true, um, that I, it's important to me that claims of anti-Semitism are not in fact used to silence legitimate instances of pro-Palestinian activism, because there is much legitimate pro-Palestinian activism here in Davis. Um, this is both because it pains me personally to have Jewishness, which is a very important part of my identity, to be associated with discrimination against Palestinians, and also because I worry that it makes it more difficult to properly address anti-Semitism when it does in fact rear its ugly head um, if the definition of anti-Semitism is watered down to include aspects of pro-Palestinian activism that I find to be legitimate and important. So what I am asking here is for you to be thoughtful when you are considering all these concerns that have been presented today. Thank you. Thank you for coming tonight and thank you for your comments. Good evening, welcome. Uh, my name is Josh Livney. I'm just going to be a few seconds here and then I'll yield my time to uh, Seth. I believe had a few more words to say. I just wanted to echo uh, many of the speakers here tonight and saying um, one thank you. Well, I know they said this explicitly. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate this commission. And thank you uh, also for the things you said you're going to do, like the survey. It sounds amazing. And um, I hope you take into account this idea that there's a very big difference between anti Semitism and critiquing Israel. Uh, you have a long history, a uh, family history in that country, and uh, I'm also South African, so I understand the concept of when your own country has terrible politics, and that it's okay to have a critique uh, when things need to be changed. Uh, with that, I'd like to yield my time. Thank you for your comments. Thank you. I, I want to um, add one thing just as a community member, which is I really appreciate the concerns you've brought, which are obviously real about the, um, the, the terrible things that children have been experiencing in the um, Davis School District. And I, I hope with you that this is addressed in a clear and systematic way, and that uh, teachers and students are educated that this is an unacceptable thing, that it is, it is as bad and intolerable as anything that a kid can do in school, because I certainly do not want my kids encountering that. So I, I want to appreciate that. Thank you. This is, this is a very big deal. Um, I, I wanted to add one nuance, which is, of course, when uh, Michael Levin uh, says that Jews, uh, the Jews of Jews know one thing, <coughs> think one thing. It's um, you know, an expression of uh, a person's individual point of view. But obviously, from what you've seen tonight, there's a diversity of perspectives. And in that, um, on that note, I want to add something a little bit more professional um, as a Jewish studies scholar which is that there's a great enthusiasm now uh, for the ADL's educational materials. I know that this is being um, offered and adopted in many universities, um, and in particular, the, the definition that they use, the ADL uses, uh, of anti-Semitism has a particular um, slant. Uh, and this definition, um, in particular, emerged under the guidance of a pro-Israel organization, the AJC, and one of its main innovations was to explicitly and broadly connect criticism of Israel with anti-Semitism. And indeed, the majority of its defining examples, 7 out of 11, uh, do involve criticism of the state of Israel. Uh, and as a result, though, and this is the kind of thing that your you know, corporate counsel or city lawyers will be, you know, want to know about, um, it is this definition that has been used in lawsuits uh, against, for example, Harvard, I believe Penn, uh, a number of others. Uh, and so it's good to know just what's in the definition when you accept it. Uh, and in particular, it equates um, all anti-Zionism uh, with anti-Semitism. And one really interesting thing that this does Jewishly, of course, is that it rules out, for example, the largest Hasidic court in the world, the Satmar Hasidim, uh, who are vehemently anti-Zionist, and it's based on their theological principles, which, of course, you know, I don't always uh, all agree with. These are ultra-Orthodox Jews and Hasids who are, you know, are very patriarchal and everything like that. But because of their theology, their sincere and long-held religious beliefs, 
they happen to believe that uh, for theological reasons, the state of Israel is not valid. Uh, they're certainly, they're, they're not the majority of Orthodox Jews by any means, but they are the largest Hasidic court in the world. Uh, and they would be, by the ADL's definition, anti-Semites. Uh, similarly, the many, um, many often younger Jews and progressive Jews who uh, vehemently criticize the recent actions of the state of Israel as genocide um, would be most likely ruled uh, anti-Semitic and therefore perhaps uh, subject to all kinds of you know, punishment or suppression of their speech under that definition. There is another definition that was created by a broader range of scholars uh, and it would endorsed including by the uh, people at UC Davis who study the Holocaust and genocide, uh, spe specifically David Beale and Diane Wolf, are the people who probably have the longest track record of really publishing on this and working on it. And the, this is called the Jerusalem Declaration on Anti-Semitism. And it was designed um, in part to avoid bonding all Jews to the state of Israel, which ironically itself is often considered an anti-Semitic act. Israel does something bad, then all Jews must be responsible for it. So uh, I urge you to consider um, the nuances and the fine print of these definitions, because um, as the uh, recent wave of lawsuits shows, uh, people who sue institutions most certainly will consider uh, what is in the fine print. And also from a scholarly point of view, uh, the Jerusalem definition is designed um, to combat, to, to, be, to be helpful, to be what you could call intersectional, uh, in also combating Islamophobia, to not, for example, rule out uh, black South African experience and knowledge of history, because of course, if, if someone like um, Nelson Mandela or Desmond Tutu would say that the state of Israel practices apartheid, uh, would, and, and from their own experiences, I think it would probably be fair to say that they have an understanding of apartheid. Uh, this would also be ruled uh, anti-Semitic speech, uh, and, you know, quite possibly uh, prosecuted or some, something along these lines. And so there is the danger uh, with some of the definitions being proffered by the ADL of them being weaponized um, against um, uh, in, 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 in acts of, let's say, anti-black racism, Islamophobia, etc. So it's just good. That what I'm saying is, and this is uh, again wearing my scholarly hat. It is always good to read the fine print. And again, I want to thank everyone for their time and participation. Thank you, Seth. Professor Saunders. So actually, I forgot to say yield my time. I know my time, the timer didn't go when I was speaking, so may I, may I make one quick statement? Uh, I will allow it, yeah, exceptional. Thank you, appreciate it. So while Michael Levy was speaking, the gentleman who just spoke to you was talking, and I gently uh, suggested he be quiet while Michael Levy was speaking. You know what he did to me right here in this room? He put his finger in his nose, went like this, and laughed in my face. That's all I want to say. That is a good word. Thank you. It's, it's really not, it's really not very uh, collaborative. So, yes, Gary, I see you. Thank you for your taking us back to order. Okay, so we have heard about, let's say, I counted about 12 public comments, and we, we are not really straight on the timer tonight. Do we have any additional public comments from our community members? And that is time. So I'm going to close the floor to public comments. I, um, <clears throat> before we discuss this, commissioners, would you like a few minutes recess or do you want to keep going? Recess? Okay, so um, let's take a few minutes so we have also an opportunity to process everything that we heard. We're not taking your words lightly. Uh, I would like to thank you all again for coming tonight. It takes courage to share very personal stories and how you've been personally impacted by all that's happening. You're invited to, to stay and we're going to, um, the Commission will resume talking and um, together try to figure out the best way to move forward. Thank you all again. Uh, we are taking an about five minutes recess time to do what we need to do together. Thank you. <coughs> Okay, good evening again, 802s.
so we are resuming our meeting. So for the record, we are on agenda item 6A, public forum on recent hate incidents in the Davis community. Before our break, we heard <coughs> a series of um, public comments. Many described um, anti-Semitic incidents, both on campus and in the community. Um, so the summary that I'm making now is not exhaustive, but I also want to know that it was um, mentioned and encouraged. Um, there was, how do I say that, calls for solidarity across groups. Um, so that is something that we hear. <coughs> um, some recommendations, some of our public speakers left documents to be put in, in the records in the minutes. So I want to thank again everyone who came out tonight and, and who spoke and would like to open the floor to our commissioners and also state that what we're discussing right now intersects with the work of um, the subcommittee on the Israel and Gaza situation and its impact um, on our residents. So Kevin, I can see that you're going to. Madam Chair, I just wanted to, to know, thank you for your, your comments and obviously <coughs> the, the public is here. I just wanted to, to make folks aware who aren't already that the California Civil Rights Department um, has a service and a website, California Against Hate. And this is, the website is CA and BS, as in persons, hate.org. And um, I'm looking at the website right now. It just mentions that all victims and witnesses of hate incidents and hate crimes can report and are eligible for free hotline support services. We've heard um, a number of folks tonight mention um, concerns about safety in reporting. And I just wanted to note that um, this service does allow for <coughs> anonymous complaints um, and reports. Um, so I just uh, wanted to make folks aware, if you weren't already, that that is an additional resource, CABSHate.org, the Civil Rights Department of the State of California. Thank you, Kevin. No? Sure. I have some notes here, so it'll be just a minute. Okay. Um, I guess I just want to start with my gut response, which is the same it has been for a while to some degree. I'm, I'm so disappointed in how flawed we turn out to be in Davis at having civil discourse and just being civil when um, we're on different sides of an issue. So often it's so easy and it feels like, you know, we're a monolith or it just feels like we're all on the right side of justice and um, things got a little complicated here and a lot of our civility just, it just really feels sad to have been in Davis so long and raised my kids here and, and to now feel like this is a different town than I felt like it was. So I know a lot of other people are feeling that too and I just feel that every day. I am heartened, however, that so many people keep showing up, and especially when it's getting scary to show up for a lot of people, that we have so many people who keep showing up and putting forward the messages that they're passionate about in like civil and respectable ways. And I know I've seen some of the same people in other venues, and it takes a lot of time and energy to keep putting your voice out there. And I just, I'm heartened by, like, that gives me a lot of hope that we're going to keep talking about this and we're going to keep listening to each other. <clears throat> um, things that I heard tonight that I just want to, like, reflect back are that the Jewish community is not a monolith and that anti-Semitism hurts all Jewish people. I know there are many different ideas about what exactly anti-Semitism is. I've looked closely at both of the definitions mentioned tonight and several others. I know that the definition is really important. I know that's something our, our committee and the um, city council needs to keep looking at and thinking about. Um, but there are many things that are undeniably anti-Semitic and the things that we can agree on um, are not being taken as seriously as, as they should be from what I hear. And I have some questions related to that in just a minute. Um, I know in particular when it comes to the existence of the State of Israel and the actions of the State of Israel, there are many different opinions about where the line becomes, you know, where the thing, the statement becomes anti-Semitic, and that needs to be something we continue to talk about in <coughs> um, I hear that there are many more hate crimes, and I'm 
aware that there are many more hate crimes against um, Jewish people than against other groups. Um, I think that it is unique that anti-Semitism is coming from the left and the right, which is not the case with other kinds of hate speech. So I, I know, I believe that that is different, and I hear that coming from people. Um, and then uh, I hear that we lost at least one student in the school, in the school district as a teacher in the schools. That um, makes me very sad. I, I believe, unless I misunderstood, um, Mr. Levy saying Mr. Seller used to be a member of the school district. I suspect we might have had other people who have silently slipped away from us in all of this. And I'm, I'm sure that there are others who are thinking about that. That's heartbreaking. Our schools are already in declining <coughs> enrollment, and just the fact that for people to leave for, you know, if their family is moving, it's very different for people to leave because we didn't even make them feel safe at school and as a teacher. I hate that. So, uh, what I want to ask, and what I'm not aware of, and I don't know where we get all this information, but what I want to, to ask the commission what, if you already know, or if we can look into more, I don't understand what the current police response has been when anti-Semitism is reported, <coughs> and other hate speech, because this is not the only hate speech in Davis, as we well know. Um, so I, I, I'm not familiar with what the police response is, and I'd like to know more about that, and which things are getting reported to the police and which aren't. And I heard um, NJ Commissioner Chair Movando ask, um, no, mention that if things are on public record, we can have access to them, and so I'm interested in us getting more of that information. And then I am aware of what my school has done in terms of the anti-Semitism that has happened at Da Vinci Junior High and at Da Vinci High School, but I'm interested in what the responses of other schools have been, and, and I know, I wish Kate was still here, but I know that the district is, is working on um, heightening our understanding, um, educational opportunities for teachers, educational opportunities for students. Um, there are some very specific actions that are being taken there in the schools. And so the last thing is where, where I'm at is uh, I heard people say the same thing I've been thinking. I started out when our subcommittee formed in October, I want to say. I started thinking like we need opportunities to bring people together and have civil discourse. I still thought that that was, um, was something that we were ready for. And I, I guess I'm feeling right now I want to hear everybody's opinions. Um, and obviously the um, city council will make final decisions on a lot of these things. And, we are here to discuss and, and provide opinions, but I'm much more in a space now of like we all just need more education. And so educational opportunities for adults, we're, we're working on a workshop series. I hope we hear back from the city council soon about being able to move forward with that. Um, I hear the need for a countering anti-Semitism workshop or multiple of them, um, including maybe even just unpacking definitions for like an entire workshop. Um, I hear the need for some civil discourse practice or uh, practical tools for people to have, either in just having civil discourse or um, like an, almost like we have our upstander fair put together for the, by the Phoenix Coalition. I almost feel like we need upstander training for adults because I think a lot of people are hearing things that they know are offensive but aren't um, clear about how to respond to those things. And so the allyship that we have around other issues we don't, we don't have now, the solidarity that people are asking for, People who want to do that don't know how to, so I hear that there's an education for that. And then I'm just really interested in amplifying, like I hear people saying um, that we don't know, a lot of Davis doesn't know that these things are happening. If you're not watching the school board meetings, the city council meetings, um, if you're not in the inner circle of what's happening to a particular child in school, um, how, where is the education for all of Davis about these things so that there can just be um, you know, eyes, on, eyes on the situation? And so I'm not exactly sure what the right venues are for that, but I, I hear that and I think it's important. <coughs> and then I'm really interested in this idea of a climate survey. In the 25 years I've been in Davis, I don't remember anything like that happening. Um, I've done it in smaller venues, like in schools and churches and that sort of thing, but I'm really interested in whether, like, what are, what are the ways in which that's um, possible or um, that that could be an accurate reflection of what people are experiencing. And so I'm, hoping that that's continued conversation and that we could figure out a little, keep that keep that um, idea developing. So, told you it was gonna be a lot. That's what I wrote down, that's what I wanted to share, and I am done for the moment. For the moment. <laughs> Thank you, Naomi. No that, that was very thorough. Thank you for uh, your remarks. <clears throat> I wanna address the question you asked about, you know, the police response, what it's been, and uh, if we have information 
Uh, as far as I know, the commission, this commission as a body, we don't yet have that information. Those suggestions were made to us um, in terms of, you know, also tracking that down um, not that long ago. Maybe, um, you know, if um, she can, Gloria can um, share something on that because it is not impossible that our council members have already spoken to, to the authorities just to um, know if there's been complaints officially and so on. I think that our mayor, um, Chapman, uh, touched on that a little bit in the statement he put out today. That being said, uh, we are planning, <coughs> um, from my understanding, that have to be confirmed by my colleagues tonight, but from the few conversations that I heard, uh, the sentiment is indeed to, um, to ask for, for that information to the authorities. Uh, to the police, and then if we can, uh, we're going to defer to Michael Villalobos on that, who is a UCD based liaison. Uh, maybe the UCD PD also um, will have some information that, that might be available to us. I don't know, I cannot say that for sure. Um, Gloria, is there anything you would like to, to say at this point? Uh, good evening, and thank you. I want to add my thanks for the work that's being done here this evening, and I want to also thank the community that has come out, came out this evening, and has come out to City Council. And I know this is a tough, this is a tough time for our community. And I've met with several people individually um, from our Jewish community, and I know that there are a lot of folks who feel isolated and alone and unheard and unseen. And I think that it's important for us as a community to have these, these um, opportunities for people to come forward and to speak. And, you know, today I was speaking to somebody and, you know, talking about what can we do. And unfortunately, I feel like the answer is there's not a whole lot we can do to change the actions of the people that are making, you know, these uh, times so difficult for people, people who are bigoted. You really have to start that work when people are in kindergarten, right? You have to you have to reach way back. But we can stand together as a community and be united and show each other that we are allies and we're allies for everybody. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that that you know <coughs> let that be said. Uh, as far as hate incidents and reporting, thank you for sharing that, 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 this is, that there's a reporting on the state website, but our website, our police department website, also has a place that people can report hate incidents. And it is a good way for people who may feel intimidated about going into the police department and reporting to report hate incidents, uh, hate crimes, and it's really important that people do that because then we can see if what trends are in our community. And even if it's not a crime and it's only an incident, most and the police can only really do something if it's a crime. Uh, and, then, and then again, only if you know there is, you know, person is caught really. Um, but it is important for us to. Uh, to report the incidents so that that can be uh, forwarded. And I know that our police department is in touch with um, outside agencies uh, to also keep track of, you know, things that may be out there, the chatter that may be out there so that we are aware and people can uh, continue to be safe. I don't know if that answers all the questions. <coughs> Can you remind me if I've missed something? No, that, that was, um, I think, very complete as well. The basic question was if um, you have gotten a report from the Davis police, you know. Um, Aside from what um, is in the public, <coughs> we don't have any other reports, and, uh, and all of that is public record, so people can go and take a look at the, uh, what the police department has. Thank you very much, Councilmember Partida. Um, anyone else would like the floor? Maybe Vice Chair Mohammed. Um, I think 
and this will probably come up with the, <coughs> the subcommittee's updates on that. So I want to save most of that for that discussion. But I do, what, what I am hearing from the public and from the discussion so far is that there are three overlapping but concrete things that we can discuss and perhaps recommend. One of them is workshops or facilitated <coughs> conversations, small groups, different groups of different size, being sensitive to people's willingness, sense of uh, being able to come forward to gain a better understanding, uh, to share their experience, to heal. <coughs> so that's, that's one area of sort of education workshop facilitated. The second piece is real, that's come up over and over and over again is this reporting and survey. So knowing what is actually going on, knowing what is being reported, um, finding ways that make reporting and making people aware of things that are taking place in terms of hate, anti-Semitism, um, et cetera, more visible. Um, not just, well, there's a place where you can report it and that's it. Um, but the survey, so the data getting the statistics on how people feel, um, sort of what is it, Jewish identity, what that means in Davis, uh, Muslim identity, what that means in Davis. That kind of survey is very powerful because though, and what I study for a living is the history of racial trauma. So one of the things that happens during trauma is that our sense of what we can do gets diminished whether we've experienced the trauma directly or whether we've witnessed the traumatization of someone else, we tend to sort of like, oh, there's, there's a kind of a, almost a studied helplessness that creeps in. So the workshops, the data collecting, reporting, the second piece can alleviate some of that sense of helplessness and create unity. I think part of what we're trying to, we've identified very clearly is that this community is divided. <coughs> on multiple levels. This is a divided community. So, if we can identify that, then we can go about unifying it. Right? Once you identify the problem, problems, um, you don't just chalk it up to it being complicated or it all depends on the context. You say, all right, how do we go about addressing it? Small steps, medium-sized steps, what have you. The third piece, and I've heard this both, I didn't attend the city council meeting, but I sat through the recordings um, and, and took notes, training uh, for commissioners, for city council, for members of, of the um, governing bodies within the city, within Yolo County. There needs, there appears to be some need for training as to what we're dealing with so that it can be identified, defined, discussed. So our awareness for those of us in, in some form of public service can be more helpful, right? Can have that reservoir. So those three pieces, and I'll save the rest for later. Thank you very much, Ruben. The only thing that concerns me when you say I'll save the rest for later, it means that we are keeping our community members here probably until the end of the meeting. So thanks for bearing with us. Uh, <coughs> maybe Edgar and Connor, I don't know if she, there's anything you'd like to share before I, I go, yes, Connor. Yeah, so a few other uh, incidents that I <coughs> did want to mention. Uh, some people have brought these up during public comments and also in emails we received. Uh, but there has been a good amount of harassment against Palestinian students and their supporters on campus. Um, and that is something that I think the commission should be aware of, uh, especially in certain departments and certain schools on campus. Uh, there was also a police brutality incident at a demonstration uh, as well in the administration building. Uh, so those are things that are important to be aware of. And I think sort of related to that, we also do need to think about what is the line between documenting things and harassment. And that's obviously a question that would require discussion. Um, but that is an important thing to uh, think about because sometimes those things can look similar, but the question is 
what are they being used for, and are they being used to intimidate, or are they being used for other reasons, and if so, what? And that is something that is uh, an open question, because, again, we know that different groups uh, do different forms of documenting <coughs> or surveilling, depending on what you want to call it, and these groups do it for different reasons, and sometimes those reasons are positive, and sometimes those reasons are negative. Uh, for instance, we do know that both militant fascists and police do a lot of surveillance and documenting, and they often do that for negative reasons. Um, I also do want to say that I think that different forms of bigotry come up in a lot of uh, spaces, so I think that includes anti-Semitism as well as racism and transphobia and ableism and other forms of oppression. These things do come up in leftist spaces as well as other spaces throughout society because they are systems that are baked into our society. So I think it's important to work against them collectively while also acknowledging that they do end up presenting themselves in these different spaces. And that is true of most forms of oppression because, again, our society has these things ingrained culturally and structurally. So that is part of wider oppression that needs to be worked against. And then, related to that, I also do think that forming solidarity is the best way to address all of these forms of oppression and bigotry against all marginalized groups. That we do need to work together in a holistic, collective way to resist oppression, both in Davis and elsewhere. And I think the anti-fascist removing the anti-Semitic flyers and then uh, destroying them is a good example of taking this active action against oppression and bigotry and doing like actions in solidarity with different communities that are being targeted. And that, again, is true in Davis, but it's also true elsewhere. So it does mean working toward justice in Israel and Palestine, which includes equal rights for everyone there, along with working for justice in Davis. Thank you, Commissioner Goldman. Um, Lian, is it okay if I call on you? Maybe you'd like to, to share something. For members of the public, Lian uh, Friedman is our interface. Um, I would just echo some of the, a couple of uh, points that have already been made. One is really looking at the definition of anti-Semitism, being very clear um, that there, and this has been, this was said by community members, uh, there are a lot of different <coughs> feelings about what Judaism is, what Zionism is, what anti-Semitism is, and I think we need to be real clear on how we use those terms. And another point is also, you know, um, looking at um, bias against not only Jews, not only looking at anti-Semitism, but also um, the Palestinian and pro-Palestinian members of the community have also been harassed. And um, we need to consider that as well. Thank you, Ian. Yes, Commissioner Goldman. Thank you. Um, you know, this just kind of brings me back when I first joined the commission um, during COVID, and there was a massive stream of anti-Asian hate that was happening in Northern California, in Davis, and the hardest part that I think when we formed a subcommittee to try to find out what was going on in the community was hearing all of the actual different voices of what was happening. We, we couldn't actually find a method, uh, an effective method, mainly because of the lockdown, uh, but also just because of a community that doesn't typically speak up when you know, hate incidences occurs against them. So when we look at forming these community surveys and we look at going out, you know, I think it's really important that we really thoughtfully make sure we have all the voices of the and know that you know anybody who feels attacked is attacked. 
And, you know, I, in this essence, I think we were creating a helpful model that can be taken into other communities, especially communities that don't typically speak up. Um, you know, it's really sad that the only time I would hear about incidents is because I heard it on next door or through a Facebook post. <coughs> And for right now, it seems like people will only hear about things if you go to a city council meeting or you go to a school board meeting. So I think a lot of this, a great lesson learned is to be able to expand our reach to hear from the community, but then also to share those stories with the rest of the community. Because then I think we are doing a better service for ourselves to learn from what everybody's going through, but then also so that everybody else in the community can share and learn and hear um, from what people are going through. So I'm very uh, I'm eager to learn how we're going to do that and if I can, you know, how we can help do that in the best way possible. Thank you, Edgar. Michael, you know your turn. Your turn is coming. So I was going to call on you. Oh, but no pressure. You don't have to say. No, <laughs> feel this better. I have nothing uh, to add. Okay, <clears throat> but on that note, I want to thank you again for the resources that you shared um, earlier regarding what's happening on, on, on the campus and your invitation for community members to join. So, um, <clears throat> I have a few things uh, to share. So first I want to thank my colleagues, um, thank, thanking Councilmember Partida for joining us. She's been, as many times as she could attend our meetings, always there. But to my colleagues, I really thank you uh, for not shying away from something that is a very difficult, not just topic, but our community is hurting. And uh, many of you have given time outside of this commission's meeting to meet with several community members. I have lost track of the amount of meetings that you, you've had um, outside of the commission. So that's dedication, you're not paid for that, but you care a great deal, and thank you. <coughs> and also want to I'm, I'm stating the obvious, you know, we are not just listening. The reason we decided to have an open um, recent hate incident agenda, standing agenda item, so if you come into this meeting for the first time, uh, that agenda item is year-long always on, on the agenda. So if anything, the reason is so that if something happens in the community, we're able to react as quickly as we can. One of the reasons we have that agenda item is not just so that we hear you out and then we discuss and we share our thoughts. The, the, outcome, <coughs> the you know, outcome we are after is always answering the question, we heard what we heard, this is what happened, now what can we do and how can we uplift the community. Like We want to be able to identify tangible actions that as community members we can take and also as recommendations you know that we can bring to city council. So I'm sharing all of that because this is where we're going next in this conversation. So for me what is on my mind <coughs> are two things. It's realism and also action. So there is what realistically we can do after hearing everything that we heard tonight. But there is also the fact that as it was expressed by all of you and by several on this commission, we need to do something. We can't just um, sit and, and be passive. Um, so we need to identify what are the actions that we can take. We want to thank so many of you who spoke out because your comments were very constructive. <clears throat> you shared your experience, lived experience, but many of you also um, offered <coughs> suggestions on what needs to happen. And so as was mentioned, having a climate survey is one of those, but this is where I want to bring back realism and, and action. The members of this commission are all volunteers. We care, we care, we care. Um, and I'm not going to lie to you, the past months have been very hard on us. On our body, on our sleep, um, <clears throat> and so on. We've been a bit stretched. So the reason I'm bringing up realism is because I think that this is what needs to happen next. We all need to collaborate. So there is not one person or one body that can solve the tensions that we are dealing with, that can address the injustice and the inequality. This is a moment where I think <coughs> our city and our community is being tested on how you know, we are going, whether or not we're going to find ways to still try and connect with each other. So I want to encourage us um, to find ways to collaborate, and by that I mean 
the commissioners here. We're going to continue to do the work. We're going to continue to serve the best way that we can. Um, but we need a collaboration review with community members. And so meaning that after tonight, please don't disappear on us, right? But also, <clears throat> we need to connect with the right organizations. And I'll give you just a few quick examples. I won't go too much into the details, but so you have a sense of what's going to happen next with the Commission. So we have identified several steps that we want to take. Um, several of them are under the form of, of workshops. The workshops are meant to be interactive, but are also meant to be safe spaces uh, for people. And they are meant to equip community members with practical tools that everyone can use in their, you know, on a weekly basis in daily life. Some of that include <coughs> how do you show up in solidarity for someone else. It's not enough to ask someone, are you okay, what do you need? You know, there are, there are techniques that we need to be aware of. We need to know of the resources that already exist in the community as what was some of what was shared tonight. But once we have that information, we do have the duty to share that with people who are going to need that information as well. So identifying the organizations that are going to help us um, implement everything that was suggested and that we agree needs to happen is essential. The Euro Conflict Resolution Center is one of the organizations um, that was mentioned. So um, we have already connected with them. They came to the MLK Day um, event. Um, and they're also aware of the workshop series. I, I had a chance to speak with the executive director. <coughs> but that is my point. So my, my um, question, not question, plea to you is, if you also know, again, of um, such organizations, workshops, surveys, and so on, they're not going to be done by us, you know. And I'm being honest. If someone on the commission has the expertise, then yes. Right? But <clears throat> designing a survey, we have the intention of connecting uh, with someone who is an expert at doing that. We want to make sure the questions are not going to be biased. Right? So we want to make sure that everything is done correctly. Um, and then same with anything else that has been mentioned. So again, if you, you know an organization or uh, trained facilitators that you would want to recommend, don't hesitate to share the information. So that is um, <coughs> mainly what I wanted to share. Then another quick reminder, you already know what I'm going to say, but I feel the need to express it out loud. Of course, we are, um, as a commission, called to serve everyone in the community. And I'm pausing here because there are people who make it very hard because of where they stand and if whether or not they're helpful. But that said, um, <coughs> We talked um, mainly tonight about um, anti-Semitism and we are committed to addressing that the best we can in community, in collaboration with everyone. But also, just so you know, <coughs> we've also, of course, um, had complaints when it comes to Islamophobia and this is also something we have a duty um, to address. So as we're reaching out to our police force and ask if there has been, you know, if we can have access to any um, complaints about um, anti-Semitic events, we also have the duty to ask if there have been incidents when it comes to Islamophobia and, and that can give a baseline um, moving forward. And so I'm sharing that to be expected. And um, I think this is what I want to, all that I, I have um, for now, I want to invite you to stay tuned. You know that there is work um, in progress in the making our meetings are public record. You're here tonight because you know how to reach us. I'm pretty sure every single one of you almost have emailed us. So I'm going to assume you have the email address. Um, it's online for those who are wondering about that. Chair Mabondo, may I make a couple of comments? Yes, of course. You're going to tell me that I'm over time and I need to ask my colleagues if they want to stay a bit longer. <laughs> Oh, that was not one of them, but you do need to do that as well. <laughs> Actually, I was, I was just going to say that um, Vice Mayor Vaitla and Councilmember Arnold will be setting up a meeting with a representative from Hate Free Together, which is getting developed, and will be calling on a member of the HRC to be a part of that initial meeting, mm -hmm. and they will move forward. Um, Hate Free Together is really making some steps and, and should be working on their webpage and some initial um, information to be available soon. 
I think that it's probably time for uh, Jenny Tan, our Director of Community Engagement, who is the city representative for the Hate Free Together, to come to this commission to share what they've got going on. So I encourage us to maybe consider doing that sooner rather than later so that this commission and the members of the public can learn more about what's happening there and how all of the different entities involved will be collaborating and working together. I assume there might be also some educational opportunities for the community and that sort of thing to come out of that. So um, with that, I think uh, we can see if maybe Jenny can come next month. I, since you mentioned it, so I want to make note, make sure that we add it to the future agenda items. So maybe we can have that on the agenda next month. And Carrie, what would we do without you? Because I meant to talk about the hit free together and sleep my morning was on, on, on my notes and thanks for bringing that up. Great, no, uh, so I'm glad that, I'm glad that we uh, were able to make sure that we, we spoke about that uh, because I know that there has been a lot of talk uh, in that subcommittee, uh, the council subcommittee who, that is addressing the hate that's in you know, talking to the hate free together, and especially uh, because of the recent incidents, so I know that there is a, a lot of movement going on, um, and you know the the whole reason for this uh, collaboration is so that we can bring groups together that are all concerned about these types of incidents, and I think when we're not in silos that we will be able to, to do this work. I know there's a lot of great work that's being done and a lot of the social justice um, you know, groups that a lot of our congregations have. Um, and a lot of, we have nonprofits in, in our community that also work on diversity and inclusion. If we can get everybody at the table, I think that we will hopefully not uh, feel so isolated when these incidents happen. Thank you very much, Gloria. And maybe not duplicate efforts. If we can combine efforts into some like real substantial things happening rather than doing little bits and pieces. So I'm very excited about your future. Okay. Okay. That was Commissioner Pickett. Okay. okay, so I think um, well, we, we, that was a lot tonight. And also, um, I normally on the commission, again, we are um, usually pretty good at following our guidelines. Um, but I, I want to address um, when I, um, our community member, when I, I let you again have the floor a second time, I need to watch myself because if I give you that privilege, I have to give it to everyone. And um, so just I'm calling myself out on that. But I thank you for, for speaking. Okay, so this is what I suggest. I think that there is a lot to chew on, um, to, to reflect on. Um, lots of avenues and, and um, initiatives that we are committing to pursuing. Uh, we can, we are hoping to get um, Jenny Tan to give us an update on the Head Free Together and it, there will be also um, a gathering of, of several representatives on, on that. I, at this time I would like to um, close our time on agenda item 6A, so on the recent hit incidents. Before I do that I feel like I'm forgetting something. Quick mention of the teacher, the DGST teacher that was already mentioned, um, a black teacher who had the N word <coughs> tag outside of her classroom and didn't know about that. And that was pretty traumatic that happened at the end of December. Um, and mentioning that again as a, a reminder that our educators do need our support. And so um, the work they're doing is not easy and they're not just teaching our kids. I know for a fact that they are also attending to the anxiety of the, the parents as well. They're trying to be there for everyone, so just um, again a reminder for us to also be there for them. Um, I'm closing our time on agenda item 6A. <clears throat> Before we continue this meeting, I need a, a quorum from the commissioners. May I please respectfully ask for about 30 minutes, additional minutes of your time, um, so that we um, at least have a chance to say a few words on the, the items that are coming up. Members of the public, I see that you're leaving. I want to thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. So, um, what, yes, so, so I see that item D is a request from, uh, for co-sponsorship 
And I don't know if you're going to get all the way down to item D, so, and I know that we have someone here who would like to speak yeah. to that, and I'm hoping that maybe you can move that item mm -hmm. up. All in favor of moving, um, First you were extending 30 minutes. That's true. Yeah. So okay, so let me know the We do need a motion if you want to extend the time, please. Mm -hmm. Seconded. That was very quick. Okay, all in favor, raise your hand. Was that for 30, was that for 30 minutes? Yes, yes. Okay, for 30 minutes, I'm timing myself here. Um, the motion passes unanimously. So that is done. We're going to continue for 30 more minutes. Now, um, second motion. Do we have a motion to um, next agenda item for it to be commission co-sponsorship of the film screening? 60. Make a motion for 60 to be moved to the current position and on the agenda. Okay, Commissioner Mohamed and Bakers are really on it tonight. You're moving us quickly. <laughs> so, um, all in favor, raise your hand. The motion passes unanimously. So next agenda item is um, agenda item 6D. Um, am I correct in thinking that I am uh, greeting Patty? It's an honor to meet you. Congratulations on being one of 2024 API change makers in the Sacramento region. No, that was me. Oh, I thought that was you, sorry. But I was a Tom, I was a Tom Wynn. Honorary in 98, so okay. I'm on that wall. <laughs> um, that said, I am still very um, happy and honored to meet you, and thanks for correcting me. I really want to give you some type of award for 2024 and the advocacy that you're doing for us. Well, this actually is too bad that they left because this is actually collaborative. I mean, this is like low energy for you guys. Um, Patty Fong, I came here in 83, the same year Tom Wynn died. We formed Davis Agents for Racial Equality to respond to the whole issue of the community not doing very well with anti-Asian violence. Um, DARE is not really doing too much right now, but we do put out the newspaper still. And I think a lot of it is given, so if you don't, you can have a copy. For years, I've been thinking about doing a day of remembrance in Davis, but just never had time to do it. But now I've been retired for three years from the DA's office. I can do it. This is the movie I intend to show. And we have permission. Thank you, Axel. We have permission to show it. I've got vet met, uh, the vet memorial booked for <coughs> Monday. Uh, February 26. I'm working on a PowerPoint right now, trying to pull in the date, the Yolo County angle. And so I'm deep into research and, and getting some stories around. And I'm just asking you guys if you would like to co-sponsor. So far, um, Phoenix Coalition is co-sponsoring. Uh, UC Davis Asian American Studies is co-sponsoring. Um, this is actually what we're responding to. And this is the Yolo County version. And they were ordered to show up May 16th and May 17th, 1942, at American Legion Hall in Woodland. And the DVD photo mm -hmm. on the cover, that's actually the Woodland train station. They put them on the train in Woodland. And, then, and after a stay somewhere, they went, sent them out to Colorado. Anyway, Day of Remembrance is important because we're repeating history all over again with all this hate and all this. I mean, right now we're talking about alien land laws, uh, trying to do that again because people are concerned about foreign interests coming over buying land. And it's, so, it's an opportunity for us to teach the broader community. And we have never, never really done a big one here in Davis. We've always relied on Sacramento guys doing it at the, at the California Museum. But I'm trying to get a group of speakers, presentations, just to bring in the local angle. And I hope that you, uh, the commission can just co-sponsor us. And I'm telling people bring cookies. Um, but it should be pretty simple, low, uh, low energy. <coughs> And it's a way of broadening the awareness of the community and encouraging uh, people to come out and think about this stuff. So. Thank you. Patty, may I ask, 
Um, when you ask for co-sponsorship, is there anything specific that you are requesting in terms of the co-sponsorship? If you guys want to pay the for insurance, you can pay for the insurance. <laughs> I already paid for the rental. That's the only thing I think I have outstanding right now is the insurance. Maybe you, you guys waive it somehow. I, I'm not sure if that's a possibility. It's only going to be about 100 bucks that so I heard. I'm feeling a bit high by your words because you're giving us so much power. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Gary, that was a question I had as well. So if I understand well, um, so you are inviting us to co-sponsor, of course, and I can tell you that there's lots of interest um, from commissioners to support uh, that event. Um, specifically, within the insurance, if we can, um, you're saying that the VMT is booked, but uh, the fee has not been paid yet, so if I paid the rental fee. The rental fee, yeah. I paid, paid that already, yeah. Wow. Well, so you not, paid the rental fee, and you already got the right for the movies. I just haven't paid insurance, so they haven't given me the quote yet. Okay. And so, yeah, if it can go out on the city lines, and I'm trying to figure out, you know, I'll, if the city wants to do the press release, so I do the press release, you know, get it out there to encourage the broadest community to show up. I think Councilmember Buffy that has something to share. So um, the Phoenix Coalition has insurance that we often use for events. We have an event insurance, which as uh, uh, co-sponsors, we could you know ask for a writer for this event, and we've already paid our insurance for the whole year. And so then we just pass it off for events. So if that's something that, you know, I think it's easier than trying to get the city to, mm -hmm. to cover that. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So yeah. Patty, there is already one for that social night. Let, yeah. Let's keep going. Yeah. What else do you need? <laughs> um, just that people have ideas on, on things to put into the um, PowerPoint. Uh, encourage people to contact me, pmfong at hotmail.com. Like I'm going, the, we have vignettes all out there. Bill, Bill Lauder, Will Lauder, our football coach, he told me when he was young, his mom, they lived in Alameda, and his mom let Japanese, their net Japanese friends and neighbors store their things in the church because she had the key to the church. She didn't ask permission. She just did it because it was the right thing to do. Um, there's, uh, Marty West is going to give me a picture of her parents because they went out to Manzanar to teach. So I'm going to try to, you know, capsule that into the PowerPoint. But those little <coughs> stories out there, one thing I'm really responding to is when the Korematsu naming thing was happening. Some really significant person, and David said, uh, the removal of Japanese Americans didn't happen in Davis, so we shouldn't even talk about Korematsu being appropriate name for that school. It was a pretty pro high profile person who said that <coughs> and nor Kumagai remembers hearing it too. So we need and this yeah, we just need to educate people that this kind of history that we're uh, that we had in the past, we need to understand it and not repeat it. Uh, sure, I may just have a yes, question. Um, speaking uh, of that history, Patty I know you mean by just to email, but you, because you're right here, I wanted to ask you a question. I have heard that um, Mr. Covell, for whom Covell Boulevard is named, I believe was a former mayor um, at that time in Davis, who, um, I don't know if he was at the Woodland train station, but um, I believe um, was sort of encouraging and, and promoting um, the a band. exclusion. Yeah. Um, the the law professor, I can't remember her name, who was pushing the Kumada or the Korematsu naming, she gave me her research and she gave me a couple of enterprise articles from June of <coughs> June of uh, 43, where it says that the Davis City Council was actively considering a ban. But now that I know I can go to the library and look at the microfiche. I'm going to find out that resolution never passed because otherwise, if it did pass, then I'm going to come back and ask you to rename Colbell. <laughs> so moving. <laughs> I have to confirm it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that I know anything that you don't know, but the thing that I became familiar with uh, a decade ago or something is about 
um, how the I-5 corridor, the choice of the I-5 corridor to go through what was Japantown, Sacramento, mm -hmm. was directly related to uh, Japanese internment because the neighborhood looked run down, yeah. and that was part of why they decided to run the I-5 corridor through what was our historic Sacramento, Japantown, and um, we have never had one in Sacramento since then. Everybody sort of dispersed, and so... I don't know if that's local <coughs> enough or if that's on your agenda. There's, there's new videos that are coming out about the west end, west end of Sacramento. And it was it was run down Japanese and black. So it's like, yeah, just take the freeway through there. Because they needed to redevelop it for the capital, right? Yeah. yeah. Anyway, that's my request. Thank, Thank you. you. So <clears throat> I think, um, again, to summarize, the very last request that you might have um, would be just asking for help in spreading the word, you know, in inviting community members to share um, pictures um, from that time that they might have in their family. So you add it to the PowerPoint. Yeah. And then I think Vice Chair Mohammed would like to. Yeah. Oh, Edgar, yes. And Edgar, thanks for connecting us. You know, no, this is all Patty. I mean, she reached out and has done all this work behind you know, the scenes to just get all this together. Uh, I've known Patty for a long time because I was actually one of her students back when I was at UC Davis, took a, a law class. Um, and uh, we're neighbors too. So, uh, you know, I just, I, I think the information you're digging up and the information you're finding is extremely valuable. You know, just for the history and just for the knowledge that this community needs to know, I would hate that it doesn't get the exposure that it deserves. And so my, my ask is, you know, yes, let's bring out as many people as we can for this event that's coming up in about a month. Mm -hmm. But I would also love to then suggest, beyond just the film showing, you know, maybe partnering with a bigger audience, UC Davis, um, you know, and other departments to actually if you find this amazing information, to have some type of a better <coughs> venue to showcase it. I don't know what that is yet, you know, um, but if, if we want to give ourselves like a time frame, we can work until, you know, Asian American History Heritage Month, you know, which gives us a little bit more of a window and a time span. But to then again, have an opportunity to show the film in a different venue, but then to also highlight <coughs> all the information that you're digging up and find out. Because all the stuff you all are talking about, I've kind of heard, but I've never have read any details. And I'm, it's really I'm, fascinating. I'm going through ag, ag surveys. The DA's office, as part of what the AG apologized a couple months ago, um, doing an inventory of all the lands held by, held by Japanese Americans to figure out whether <coughs> they were legally coho title or they were just tenants. And you couldn't believe how many Japanese farmers there were. They were all over the place. Portland, Zamora, Knights Landing, Woodland. Um, and their a whole inventory of the whole who's living on the land down to the three-year-old kid. Um, and this was before the executive order was signed. Because I'm looking at the dates and the stuff, it's like, that's two <coughs> weeks before FDR signed the order. So that means it was the plan. And we all sort of knew it, but it's like finding it is something else. Mm -hmm. So it's planned to get rid of the Japanese Americans. Yeah. Let's see, Madame Partida. So I, I think it would be great. Thank you, Edgar, for um, you know uh, <coughs> considering the expansion of this. I think that's a great idea. I think I'm not sure. I'd be surprised if the Yolo County Library System didn't do something for Day of Remembrance, but it would be great to partner with the county and see if maybe they're, you know, they have like a display at the library and some information around that, as well as the UC Davis also does a, a great job of, of putting on displays in their library. I don't remember if that was said, but um, has the Yolo Head Free Together team also been contacted? The, the Head Free Together team? Have they been contacted? Head free together. Would you be interested in connecting with them? Do I know them? I don't know if you do. Because that would be um, a way of connecting the county and the cities to, to your event and, you know, oh. one more platform to spread the word. <coughs> oh, okay. I can email you tomorrow. Let's do it. Thank you for your contact. Yeah.
Yeah. And the last thing I want to share, so Paddy again, thank you so much for coming tonight. And I apologize because initially um, I was trying to actually have you go first so that you don't have to wait until the end. But the last thing I want to, I want to share, um, so since we're talking expanding and opening the event, um, it, giving it as much exposure as possible, it would be interesting if we're able to do the showing uh, somewhere else in Yolo as well. Like we're privileged in Davis to have many activists and advocates, and I'm, I'm thinking of some other parts of Yolo County that might, you know, really be open. Well, it's going to be built at Yolo County Day of Remembrance mm -hmm. because um, Floyd Shimamura <coughs> out of Winters is helping me a whole bunch. Well, he's in Woodland, but grew up in Winters. Mm -hmm. And he gave me all the archive stuff. Um, so, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you so much. So, do you have to do a vote? Are you guys going to take action on this? Yeah, I mean, we, I think we're just going to, you know, officially decide to sp sponsor the event, co sponsor it. So I make a motion. That was very quick. For the HRC to act as co sponsor. And then we have them to bring, and then they came for us. Okay, so that's Vice Chair Mohammed. Do we have a second? I will joyfully second that. Okay, Commissioner Pickett, any discussions on that question? None. <coughs> so, all in favor, raise your hand. One. Commissioner Baker, yes. please raise your hand. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, yes, there are no abstentions and no nays. So, the motion passes unanimously. Um, about it very quickly, Gloria. Do you know if the CD has some kind of resolution from that or no? I don't know. Okay, so I, I just planted the seed. Okay, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> yeah, I'm hoping. So um, I'm going to conclude our time here on the Lab Agenda ITAM 6D. So we're going to briefly recap the MLK Touch on the Tongue High Green. Um, I think that we're going to go over those very quickly. The, the big attempt tonight on the recent hate incidents, uh, we really needed to spend the time we did on that. Um, so <coughs> I'm keeping track of the time here. Uh, let's uh, discuss agenda item 6B, the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. celebration uh, recap. Who wants to go first and keep it brief? Yes, Leonie. Oh, Leonie. Could I, could I propose? I don't know if it's appropriate or not, but yeah, I yeah. would be happy to like create a collection document mm -hmm. and people can just go add their reflections so that we have a document we can refer to when we make it next yeah when we create this same mm -hmm. event next year i don't know um if, if we could do it justice right now and i think we could all just in a moment of peace and quiet type our things mm -hmm. you know kind of things that we like to think we wonder we so before before Carrie um, speaks, um, when I mentioned the recap here, we're not going to go deep tonight. And then something else also in the making. So yes, um, we're going to discuss that as needed, but I think it's an excellent idea what you suggested. But also I want to, um, I'm committing to create some type of living documents that the next commission or next people will be able to use um, when putting the events again. You know, just a list of resources um, and so on. And Carrie, I could see that you wanted to share something. I was just trying to get clarification on what Lainey was thinking in terms of question feedback. Were you wanting people to just email me directly and I can compile it into a document? Is that what your thoughts were? I'm sure that is what my thoughts were. <laughs> yes, thank you, Carrie. That's exactly what my thoughts were. Thank you, Lainey. I just was trying to clarify what your, your intent was. So thank you both. There's something I do need to mention. So first, I would like to thank all of our community partners. The students were amazing. They were centered um, to have the event. They contributed artwork. They volunteered. They tabled. Um, they were marching with us. Um, yeah, the Black Student Union was very well represented this year, thanks to our youngest commissioner, Ashish Lama, who brought not just one BSU, but two. Um, so there were lots of positive feedback. The Davis Enterprise covered the event. There is an article that has been published. We had a, um, uh, let's see, who was there? Was that KCRA? It was a news, yeah, KCRA was here. Um, so we made the news somehow. <clears throat> but that said, 
Um, there is something that we were not on top of, and I'm the chair, so I'm going to take the floor for that, of course. Um, the, you know, anyway, the, oh my goodness, we should, here we go, yes, we should all speak French, because that's where my brain is going at. So it was the March, right? So, <laughs> I'm, I'm just, I need to state it for the record, so we were marching this year. The reason the march was cancelled last year was because of the weather. So it was assumed that it would be a march this year because the weather was cooperating. The only <laughs> problem with that is that when came the moment to march, we didn't have a march leader, and that's my fault. Um, so just um, making a note on the record um, that Commissioner Wong Kian kindly offered. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm putting on the spot. No, but Edgar has much experience in organizing matches, so he offered to share resources and, and whoever will be organizing that next year, he's happy to, um, to, to share some resources to, to make sure it happens ahead of time and not on the day of, on the spot. So, um, very quickly also, um, normally when we march on MLK Day, we have a banner. Um, and uh, yes, and of course we have the songs ready and so on. So that's just the only thing that had to be improvised on the spot. And again, I'm taking responsibility for, for not being one woman on the time. And uh, I think, yeah, and anyone else want to add something before I close on that topic? I want you to know um, that this is not the end of the MLK conversation. I just need us to touch on it, but be brief tonight. Uh, but this is going to be again on the agenda, and we'll be able to, to speak more in depth about it. So. Yes, Commissioner Baker. I just want to say what everybody else is thinking, which is thank you to everyone involved in creating that wonderful thing. So if you guys would like to send me your thoughts and feedback, I can compile it all for future discussion. Um, I think sometimes that's helpful, as Lainey said, to reflect on that. And I always do that with the events, is pull those notes up the future year, you know, the following year as well, to look back on. I want to... Go further than, than what you said. I would like to very kindly ask our Commissioner Pickett to send you like a few questions she would like us to answer. I think that would be helpful to many of us. Not to add to your work, Leonie. No problem. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. So with that said, do we have any public comments on that item? I do not see any. Commissioners, speak now for your hold your peace. Okay. This concludes our time on agenda item 6B. We are moving on to the annual Tom Heinwein Awards. The Commission will finalize information for the 2024 Tom Heinwein um, Awards to be released in February. I'm going to turn to Carrie now to see if you have an update for us. In your packet tonight, you have the proposed timeline as well as the nomination form that was updated quite a bit last year. You guys did a, a ton of work to update the categories and the nomination form. We did not take any notes after the Tom Penguin Awards last year for any changes that you wanted to make. So I simply included a timeline that we typically go by, which has been working fairly well, and a nomination form, you know, updated with dates, etc., for this year. So I guess I'm asking if you're okay, we can move forward as we did last year. Uh, in my opinion, it seemed to be uh, much more successful than it hadn't been in years past in terms of um, getting nominations. And if so, we, you know, we can. Uh, close this item with your action. Um, if you'd like to add any changes to the nomination categories or updates to the nomination form, we certainly can do that tonight as well. When is the form released, Carrie? Sorry, Carrie. According to the timeline in your um, packet, I believe it is February 5th. Okay, so we really need to decide on that tonight, Connor. Yeah, so I. I think the changes last year were good, and I don't really have any major, like, I don't have any, like, proposals for updating that. The one thing I did want to ask about is, I know we talked about, like, just logistically having it be an embedded form instead of, like, a PDF form that then has to be, like, like, people have to fill out in the email back. So I'm curious if there's any updates on possibly making it, getting city IT people to be able to create an embedded form like on the HRC website type of we, we, we did do that last year. 
We didn't think oh, we were going to be able to, and we, we were able to do so. So okay, that is the recommendation okay. I have. On the four village, there's a highlighted spot. I need to do a little bit of work on that to make sure that we can have that happen again. Um, but yes, I know that was something that you wanted, and uh, they were able to work there behind the scenes magic that I don't know how to do to. Okay, yeah, for some reason, I I thought we barely weren't able to complete that last year, and it was still the PDF version. So yeah, that works. Thanks for confirming. That was my recollection from last year, that the form is, is still available online. Uh, just so much easier to nominate and <clears throat> okay. Um, so with that said, let me go back to the agenda. I had it, here it is. So we do have to take action on that. I'm going to assume that you all came tonight prepared and already having reviewed it. Are we ready to um, approve the proposed timeline and nomination information as it is in the packet? Thank you. You can, oh my goodness, I'm not going to say what I think right now. Do we have any public comments on this item? I do not see any, so... Oh, I have a motion seeing. to approve the changes and updates to the annual song Highland Award, including the timeline. Do we have any change? We don't have any change at first. Well, it has been seconded. Oh, okay, yes. Do we have a second? Commissioner Bowman, any questions, discussions on that before we vote? All in favor of approving the motion, raise your hand. I don't see any abstentions or opposition. The motion passes unanimously. I thank you all. This concludes our time on agenda item number six. And now, the reason why I was rushing through everything and I kept skipping the public comments is because very, very exciting agenda item, the 2024 election of the new chair and vice chair of the Human Relations Commission. Okay. Hide your joy. I'm the only one sounding exciting here. Okay, so um, <clears throat> I'm going to be a bit ceremonious about this. This is my last time today as chair of the Human Relations Commission. It has been the greatest honor of my life. I'm being very dramatic. Um, to serve you and serve our community in that capacity. More seriously, um, I really want to thank all of you. I think that our, our commission, we have done so much in 2023, coming into 2024. Um, there was a lot going on in the community, but I, I thank every single one of you. We all have a busy schedule. You show up every single time, and you go above and beyond, and you volunteer at the, you know, the Daily Phoenix Coalition events and so on. So again, I have enjoyed so much working with you in that capacity. I want to thank you for trusting my leadership and, um, and I've learned so much from you. So thank you all. That said, I am also so happy that this is my last day. <laughs> and <clears throat> so what happens next is that we do need to nominate um, someone to be chair. And after that, we're going to nominate someone to be vice chair. And we will vote on that. So do we have any nominations for chair? I do have. I do have one, but I'm trying to be polite and maybe let someone else go first. I'm not speaking, I'm just going to say, I don't, you know, I like you a lot, but I'm not going to wait a long time. I would like to nominate Dr. Romit Mohamed to be our next chair. Discussions, questions, do you want to grill Robin with questions to make sure that she's the right next person for the task? I mean, I guess, do you want to be chair? Because that is... Uh, <laughs> or, or are you willing to be chair? I might be a more accurate question. Either way. Yeah. Yes. Take it, just a second. Yes, on your time. Before you discuss, give a second. We need to discuss? No, no, no. no, no, no. Need I would like to oh, yeah. offer a second and my enthusiastic support for this plan we are discussing here for Robin Mohammed to be our new chair. Leonie, thanks so much for not leaving me hanging. Okay, so Leonie, do you want to step up and like, yeah. yes, I'm going. Okay, okay. <coughs> so we have a second. We have discussed it via um, Robin accepting <coughs> our nomination. Uh, I need to tell you that I have like the utmost trust in, in your leadership. I've seen you in action. I'm very excited um, that you said yes and about all the good things you make happen. No pressure. <laughs> so. Can we, <coughs> do we nominate the vice chair now and vote on that? Okay. Do we have a nomination for vice chair? Don't make me call names again. Oh, 
Are you serious? I nominate Kevin Craig. Then we have a second. I enthusiastically <laughs> second. <laughs> 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 it sounds like an awesome leadership team. <laughs> so the very important question of the evening, Kevin Baker. Are you willing? I, I would be pleased to assist on your chair. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Kevin, like so much stress relief coming up for me right now. <laughs> Kevin, it is an honor um, that for us, you know, to have you serve as vice chair. Thank you again for. I was very excited when you joined the commission and you bring in all that legal expertise to the work that we're doing. You're asking all the hard questions. Um, you made it very hard for me to be a good chair. I have to say because you kept pushing me to like be better. But thank you for that. So I think that um, if there is no more discussions on that, we are ready to take public comments on that. Anyone wants to share something, ask questions, or make a comment before the commission vote? I don't see any reactions. Okay, so let's vote on it. All in favor of um, Robin being chair and Kevin being our new vice chair, please raise your hand. Okay, the motion passes unanimously. We have a new chair. We have a new vice chair. Robin and Kevin, thank you, thank you so much. And I have a free person. Okay, sorry. <laughs> no, this is great. I am very excited. I thank you all for your leadership, and we are here to assist you with almost anything you need. So, this concludes our time on agenda item 6E. I'm going to just be good and continue to facilitate this meeting until the very end. <laughs> And then we have I'm required to. And then Robin will take over at the next meeting. So let's hear for commission uh, committee's update. We're going to start with the workshop subcommittee. Actually, can I can we start with the listening subcommittee and then move to the workshop because I think there's going to be a transition happening there. Yeah. <coughs> yes. Well, just I'll yield to. Yeah. Subcommittee members, I, I think the update is, is that the, the, the subcommittee fulfilled its initial charge, right, which was to go out, talk to people, gather some information, and give um, some substantive issues and questions for the HRC to discuss generally. And it looks like we're going to be continuing to discuss next steps. I would also suggest, and tying this back to comments that I made earlier, that it might be worthwhile, I think you have in your packet, a memo um, and the summary of public comments uh, document uh, that I prepared uh, for everyone to take a look at. I think it might be useful for, um, and I, I would volunteer to do this, if we could generate a preliminary report, not just of the subcommittee, but of tonight's meeting, so that we can make some report to the city council and say this is this is what we are hearing uh, perhaps there is some things some next steps for the city council to consider and of course we've also <coughs> heard that the um, the hate free together and other entities are engaged in this conversation um, it's not to preclude any of that but i think it's really important for the hrc to document the work that it's done um, so far and to submit that to the City Council uh, because we are more than a funnel of information to the public and to City Council. We're actually doing some work that's really important um, and we sh it's work that is shared. And, but I think <coughs> given our experience over the last couple of years, it's really important for the HRC to document its work so that it can be seen and we're not sidelined and we're not ignored um, or simply neglected until something explodes and then suddenly we're, we're consulted. So that, and I would volunteer to, and it would be, a, that's what it would be, a preliminary report, basically an expansion of these um, summaries that I, put, uh, that I put together and input from all of you and we could probably get that out in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Robin, Lenny, and Kevin. You want to add to that? I, I would just <laughs> say um, that I thoroughly concur with um, 
government's suggestion. In fact, I think if we did not do that, it would create the appearance that we have not heard and cared about the um, public comment that we've received. So thank you for that idea. Danny? Um, I just think the next step of the conversation is does the subcommittee continue to serve a purpose? And I have mixed feelings about that because I think when we started this conversation, we were not hearing the voices of the community. And we went out to look for the voices of the community of people we guessed who we thought might be affected by the Israel-Palestine conflict. And we, um, and, and now there is much more of a public forum about that. It went from being a subcommittee discussion to a large amount of what we spend an entire commission time on. The city council has now heard a lot on that. Um, so I can see where, as uh, Commissioner Muhammad said, that the purpose of being a listening group is sort of complete because now the larger community is listening. <coughs> I could also see the, a reason to continue with that subcommittee. For example, maybe that subcommittee would interface with Hate Parade together as appropriate um, or with the city council in terms of things related to um, you know, a specific <coughs> issue. And so, I mean, I guess we just are going to need to decide if the subcommittee continues or not. I don't know that we need to do that tonight, but I, I think that conversation needs to happen in the near future. But so, otherwise, I, I love uh, Commissioner Muhammad's idea about putting together our notes and, and getting them, making them available to the city council. I'd like to make a suggestion at this point when it comes to the point that you're raising, Nadine. So I think when it comes to deciding to the future of that subcommittee, so it was started with a specific purpose that was completed. And it, I would suggest that the subcommittee um, dissolves because that specific purpose was completed and we have it on record, like we set out to do this, this is how long it took us, we did it. And then you can start a new subcommittee with a redefined you know, goal. Because when I'm listening to you, it seems to me that you're not going to operate exactly in the same way you did when you started, right? Like you, you will be interacting also with different sets of people. So that would be my suggestion moving forward. Carrie, do you want to weigh in on that? Mm. I think that's a really good suge <coughs> suggestion. Subcommittees are supposed to have a specific purpose and complete the item, and there isn't anything that would preclude you from creating a new subcommittee, and you know, we don't know what council direction will be moving forward based on you know, um, the recent you know, mayor statement and, and this meeting of, <coughs> with a representative from HRC and hate free you know, and Jenny Tan from Hate Free together and two of our council members. So I, I think that you, you could do that and then consider a future subcommittee um, moving forward. Ms. Connor. Yeah, I think that definitely like makes sense in terms of the role of subcommittees. Um, I do think though that it could be helpful to put some of the public comments that were received today into sort of a report back uh, since we got uh, a diversity of perspectives and like more perspectives than we got at our previous meeting. Um, I also do think that we should refer to this as the Israel-Palestinian conflict or issue or something along those lines. I think that that is more in line uh, with the actual situation and also with the the name that was originally given to the um, to the uh, subject. Um, yeah, I think like in terms of trying to think about focus groups or workshops or especially a climate survey, I think those are all things that we might want to continue doing. But it does seem like in terms of Brown Act subcommittees, maybe that could be at least officially a new subcommittee. Thank you, Connor. Um, okay, <clears throat> so do we um, carry need to move whether or not the subcommittee and tonight, or is it something that carries over the next next month? What do the commissioners want to do? Do you want to touch on that tonight? Um, knowing uh, that the, your report is coming because you you have trust. Well, the, the preliminary report that I'm suggesting would really be coming from the entire commission. Mm, okay. I I would <coughs> make a motion that we conclude that we conclude mm -hmm. the work of the subcommittee. I second that motion. Okay. Thank you. So, can we, I don't know if we need a motion to do that. But that's fine. I'll go ahead and take that motion. Um, I just clarification question. So, your preliminary report that goes that comes from the entire commission that would need to come back to the commission next month for review. Would. Okay. 
So we have um, two motions. Um, discussion, question, none, all in favor, raise your hand. Okay, the motion passes unanimously, thank you very much. And uh, well done, I know those were not easy conversations, so again, thank you for, um, for the work you did on that subcommittee. Um, <clears throat> So we don't, now we're going to um, give an update from the workshop subcommittee to tell you that there is no update. We are waiting on our city council and um, you know specific council members to, um, to to let us know how they want to move forward. One thing I can share is that we did have the green light. I had asked if um, at least there was one workshop that was on disaster preparedness. Um, and it's something that is free to the city because it's um, a branch of America that reach out um, via a non-profit and they offer to offer the workshop to community members for free. So again, the idea is for to help people be ready when there is a disaster, but for as community members, for us to know how to be there for others when that happens and share resources. So we do have this one workshop not the whole series, looks like it's something that could move and um, could be moving forward. We, it will need to happen in February. Carrie, you've been part of that conversation. We would need to present it to the commission mm -hmm. for the commission to vote on, and then it would have to go to city council for approval. So that means that if we present it, we were to present it to the commission, so that can only happen in February, and that can only be presented to city council in March. Um, if it's something that you want to have the commission be um, sponsoring, for lack of a better word. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm opening the floor to, like, quick, again, first impression on that. The thing with that workshop was that time was of the essence because it was meant to coincide with the rain, rain season and the storms and so on. So by the time we get possibly get approval, you know, um, from city council, we'd be looking at spring, maybe summer. And I think um, just a reminder to tie it back into the functions of the HRC mm -hmm. and how a disaster preparedness workshop would go along with the functions that you have before you. So in your consideration, that would be something to talk about as well. Thank you, Kerry. So before pronostics, <coughs> also for your consideration, um, so I was, you know, the person who had suggested um, that particular workshop and the series of workshops as a concept as well, and understand what we're dealing with in terms of process and timing. I am in favor of that workshop happening sooner rather than later. I am offering um, to be one of the people or organizations um, making it happen if the HRC is not able to um, help make it happen in a timely manner. So I just want my fellow commissioners to be aware of that. Um, there are resources, there are organizations that are already on board. So if it's agreeable to the commission, we might not have to um, to decide on that tonight. I'm just letting you know if we're not able to, if we don't believe that we can make it happen at the time when it's need, most needed, um, there are other ways. And so I think my question to all of you tonight is, do you want to just leave that off the table and then we let things follow the course and we wait to hear from city council regarding the other workshop in the series and then we just get them started when we have a green light and you don't have to worry about that particular one. That is what I personally suggest that you do, but <coughs> yes, Kelly. I love how you know when I'm going to speak. Um, I did want to let you know that on the long range calendar for next week is the uh, City Council Subcommittee report on commissions. And I am not quite sure what that will entail, but that might be something to, to think about um, as you consider the decision tonight. It's exciting. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, so I, I think that having the, like, I would definitely be okay with um, with this event being not actually officially a city event, uh, and having, like, a few people kind of work on it independently of the city, um, and that seems like it might be good for this particular event because it's timely. I also wonder, though, if it could be a city event 
but not officially an HRC event. So basically, if it could be the subcommittee or even just NGA as an individual who asks the council to agendize it um, outside of the commission, and the council presumably has the power to do that. So potentially putting it on a council agenda in early February, even without without like officially like being approved by the commission first. <laughs> So I, I, I apologize, but I think I missed something. Um, so this event that you were trying to do is on disaster preparedness. Mm -hmm. Yes, and who's putting this on? I mean, where does the, where does the workshop, is it, is it uh, already put together as a, yeah. who, who, who provides that? <coughs> so I think that's what I missed. Yeah, so it's a non-profit that uh, works with America, so that is, um, so they like, you know, have a contract basically with the government to offer uh, disaster preparedness workshops um, anywhere it's needed in the country. So what they do, um, they're used to doing it remotely and they were open to that happening in a hybrid format where people are able to gather physically but we also um, are sharing the event online. <coughs> and it's practical uh, tips and resources when it comes to how to get ready for when there is a storm, you know, and flood, how do you get your house ready but also what it means for your insurance information. It is different from what Paul Davis put together. They had put a similar event together. And we also need to share that there is interest from the Davis Chamber of Commerce to hold, um, host a similar event specifically for the members, so for businesses. So that came to mind because you remember last year, um, our you know, Mayor Chapman, for example, business was impacted when the roof, um, you know, sure. was, yeah, uh -huh. so that's, yeah. Okay, yeah, so, so and it's glad, I'm glad that you mentioned the Chamber and Cool Davis because those are the two organizations actually that came to mind for me when you were talking about this because it seems like the natural place for them yeah. to to be. Mm -hmm. I thought um, of them. Okay, and, um, and so I, I sort of agree that maybe it is something that is that should be uh, directed through another channel. Um, both for the timeliness and also just because it, it to reach a, a broader audience, it would probably be best to do it that way. And I wonder if there are other organizations that could, you know, you could reach out to yeah. um, a lot of our community organizations to get the word out. The county library is already on board 100%, so they have offered a space if you want to use their community mm -hmm. uh, rooms and, and so on. So that's, yeah, but thank you for that perspective, that's very helpful. Okay, so I think that we have a consensus, right? So we don't need, um, the commission doesn't need to worry about a disaster preparedness workshop. Um, an individual who will not be named private citizen will um, help spearhead that effort. I think this concludes our time on the workshop subcommittee. So we will hear from city council at some point in the future. Um, very briefly, moving on to the Cesar Chavez, um, so celebrations of committees, anything you'd like to share with us in terms of updates? You've already created a whole event in your sleep and you're ready to go tomorrow. We were meeting regular we're meeting regularly. We're gonna meet next week. We're oh, we're just winding <coughs> things up. Um, just to double check, farmers market is confirmed. Yes, we've confirmed with the farmers market that April 13th will work <coughs> in the Grove area with use of the Rotary stage. Have also confirmed with the Parks and Community Services Department that there are no other things happening this year on that day in that area. <laughs> and um, I'm happy to assist you with any contacts or outreach or anything you might need from previous years or moving forward. So let me know. Yeah, I'm so impressed. Thank you. I just want to say, I didn't happen to come up with our Latinos <coughs> Unidos Club at school, but this event was happening with the city, and I just asked the leadership of that club, and they said they would love to be involved in any way you wanted them to. So if you want to get teenagers there, <coughs> talking about their experiences, or putting together a little um, booth, or selling tacos, which they do at school regularly, because somehow they know how to do that, whatever, like, they're there at your service, so I can I can be the conduit for that communication. Yeah, I definitely think that having a table would be cool. Uh, selling tacos, they are definitely 
not able to do. We talked about food last year, and the farmers market people do not want us to do anything with that. But yeah, no, having tables, we're hoping just like last year to have like any vaguely related, relevant community organizations tabling. So yeah, definitely tabling. We're still kind of figuring out like the performances of whatnot. But in terms of tables, it's almost unlimited. Thank you. Thank you all. I just at this point need to shout out Leonie, who is very quickly becoming an outreach person <laughs> with all the uh, organization that you brought on board and the way you're involving the students. So thank you for that. This concludes our time on the committee um, updates. Thank you all. We're moving on to public comments. <laughs> No public comments. <laughs> Officially, um, this concludes our time on agenda item 6F. We're now mentioning future agenda items. This has been updated as we went along. Um, anyone needs to add something before we adjourn? You all look absolutely awake. This is fantastic. Okay, so um, I think we're set on future agenda items. Um, Carrie, I think the only thing to make sure we add is the MLK day follow up. So we still need to at some point come back to that. <coughs> and then we know that there will be um, a document from um, Robin that we will be looking at uh, and that will then go to City Council as uh, the report from the listening subcommittee. So we're probably going to need this room again. <laughs> In <Yeah>. March. <laughs> we okay. just, just um, for your guys' knowledge, this room on the fourth Thursday of the month is booked every other month mm -hmm. for Valley Clean Energy. Mm -hmm. And so it is, um, was available to us tonight. And I will look for future months to see what we might be able to do. Um, but we, our main room is next door. So we'll see what kind of adjustments might be able to be made. But we do have a conflict on every other fourth Thursday. Yeah, need a bigger room. <laughs> okay, so <coughs> we wait. Uh, yes, Connor. Uh, yeah. So the um, the the reparations task force uh, ask in terms of like endorsing that. Do we know? Like, long range seems like a good place to bring that up. Like, what are the expectations? And I guess this is mostly a question for you. Um, like timelines in terms of like doing that. That could be on the agenda for the next meeting. That would still be time. And it would be breakfast for them, too. Kevin, is there, um, on the bigger spectrum of things, a timeline that we need to be aware of in terms of that is being discussed at the state level point, or not? It, it is, but there are... <coughs> the, the request is with respect to the report and recommendations mm -hmm. of the task force, mm -hmm. not any particular implementing effort. Okay, thank you. Anyone else on future agenda items? No? So we went over by more than an hour. It's 9.34 p.m. I thank you all so much for your dedication. And the meeting is officially adjourned. Have a good evening, good week, and see you next month. Thank you all. Before you go, can we all take a picture, please? Go picture Excuse for members. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Paddy, for coming tonight. Thank you.